the economy, the empty cubicles that you've seen across the country, it has not stopped. Now it's time to sort of pull back both the fiscal as well as the monetary stimulus. The Fed's being very clear they want to avoid the taper tantrum. It's going to take a long time to get it back to a normal level. We are expecting that the market will end the year lower rather than higher. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Let's get the training week started from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramwitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures up about a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500, down by a tenth rather, Tom. There's some real tension this morning. Better news out of America, worse news out of China. Yeah, I think you nailed it, John, with your first sentence. It is a trading week and everyone has to reassess. I mean, I'm gold with the volatility this morning and that oil off. But it's really interesting, John, how the recalibration of September is going to happen now. Really interesting for the debate around inflation as well, Tom. Yeah. The jobs report on Friday was a sign that the supply side of the U.S. economy was healing. Then you've got what's happening with China. Let's be clear about this. What is happening in China reintroduces some upside risk to those supply constraints and to inflation as well, Tom. That's a problem. There's noise. I mean, there's noise in the Pacific Rim. There's noise in the strong dollar. DXY, we're not through to 93. We'll talk about that. But, John, just to me, the bang-up jobs report with a bang-up revision globally means everyone has to reassess. And that's what I saw in the research notes over the weekend. What I see this morning is reassessing Chinese growth. Lisa, last <laughs> week it was Nomura. Then J.P. Morgan and Goldman follow over the weekend. It's cut, cut, cut. Downgrading uh, three, uh, third quarter GDP as well as full year GDP growth in China. And this comes as we get faster than expected inflation. That was what we got overnight that I thought was most interesting out of China. That you're seeing uh, producers, producer prices as well as consumer prices rising at a faster clip, even as officials try to curb some of those price rises. How much does this lead to a stagflation light or stag light kind of uh, environment? Well, I mean, honestly, this is the fear. How much do higher prices crimp? Growth yeah, in the near it? term and the long term. Seconds Didn't take into long the show. Term. We're not even two minutes in. Let's <laughs> get to the price action this morning on the S&P 500. <laughs> the number one question for the Federal Reserve: How much progress did we just make towards substantial? progress. We'll get into that in just a moment. Further. We're down seven <laughs> on the S&P. We're negative 0.16% on the S&P 500 that. after putting together a tidy week of gains last tidy. week. Into the bond market where yields were through 130 a little bit earlier mm. on in the session. Last week, the lows, 112.58 on Wednesday, then back through 130. Oh, the bond market's a messy. 128.17 on tens <laughs> right now. And euro dollar. Don't think I haven't mentioned, missed that mention, Tom. <laughs> you right, dollar, 117.61. It would be nice to start this program just without the interruptions. A couple of no, minutes in. No, we can't do that. Tom, you we'll know, do that in a moment, Monday. all right? And crude, crude was battered last week. Yeah. 65.48. Lisa, we're down another 4%. And this comes in the concern of the Delta variant and what that could potentially mean for global growth. Okay, so today I expected you guys to say it was going to be pretty sleepy because we're not getting any massive economic data. But no, we are getting some massive economic data. That's 10 a.m. I actually am really fascinated to see whether we hit a new record in terms of job openings. It is the U.S. Jolt's job openings data for the month of June. Last month was a record, May, uh, that reading. How much does this indicate that that supply friction of workers is not abating? If anything, it's getting worse. And what does that mean, especially as some of the enhanced unemployment benefits roll off in certain states? What is the cause of this? And what will it take to narrow this gap and get uh, workers back into the workforce? And what does it mean for wages? Also today, we're going to be hearing about substantial further progress, perhaps. Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic and Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin both speaking at 10 a.m. Raphael Bostic, uh, noon at Tom Barkin. The key question really is how much did the labor market report that we got on Friday really do to further uh, the argument for tapering sooner rather than later? Also today, just to give you a sense of the progress that we're getting with respect to the vaccinations and the pandemic, Hong Kong is planning to open its borders for the first time since the start of the pandemic to some foreigners fully vaccinated U.S. residents, uh, as well as from Canada, and also uh, U.S. residents that are fully vaccinated will be allowed into Canada for the first time starting today. You're starting to see the global borders open up just as the cases start to increase. John, make sense of it? I can't. However, it does seem like people are plotting an end to the pandemic. We'll catch up with John Hopkins a little bit later this morning. Lisa, thank you. Let's turn now to Bill Lee, Milken Institute Chief Economist. Bill, let's start right here. How much progress have we just made towards substantial progress at the Federal Reserve. 
everyone's trying to figure out how much pressure there is in that labor market. And those good numbers on Friday really went a long way to giving a positive picture. One thing that I should point out, and maybe Lisa has already pointed out, is that most of the wage gains that we're worried about uh, really go into the low-wage workers. The Atlanta Wage Tracker has shown that the first quartile is getting all the wage gains, but the fourth quartile, the higher-paid workers, are actually having a very steady uh, set of uh, wage increases, and uh, the job gains uh, are really in those entry-level jobs uh, where they're missing people because people have actually upgraded themselves. So when you actually look at how much progress we've made in the labor market, we've done a lot to restore the hospitality and leisure industry, yes, but those are the low-wage sectors, and they should be getting higher wages. The, a lot of productivity gains, though, have come about where companies have really eliminated a lot of these jobs, and we're going to find yeah. a lot of people not getting jobs. And the Fed is really concerned with not maximum employment, but the maximum extent of employment. And that's where we're going to see the tension at the Fed. The Hawks are going to say a lot of progress has been made, but the, I think the chair and, and, and Lyle Brainer, uh, the possible next chair, is going to be saying, you know, we still have a lot way to go to maximize the extent of employment gains. Bill, you, you nail the zeitgeist right now. Greg Vallier writes it up in his morning note where nothing else matters but perceived or future wage inflation. And then you go to productivity. Can we observe productivity in real time? Don't we have to wait to see if it happened? Well, Tom, as you know, it's the hardest thing to measure, especially in the service sector, which is the largest sectors in our economy. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind is that the federal government has decided to balance its budget or, or, or come raise revenues by corporate taxes. What's that going to do? Cut back on investment and cut back on these productivity-enhancing investments we need to keep inflation in check. So I think the, the real danger is that we'll look at where prices are going and we see these low-wage, low-productivity jobs dominate the wage increases and we don't have the offset coming in from the high-productivity uh, kind of investments that, that balance off the, the, the high pressure from wages. So what does this mean in terms of Fed policy and what you think it will be uh, in the months ahead versus what you think it should be? I think Chair Powell and, and most of the FOMC is still concerned that once we get past these bottleneck price increases, we're going to come back to the world where there's deflationary pressure. If we have the kind of productivity gains we've seen in the last two or three years, but if the corporate tax increases that are being put in place, not just the U.S., but around the world, start to cut into the kind of investments we need to keep uh, productivity uh, up, then we're going to have a serious inflation problem and, as you mentioned, a stagflation problem where growth it starts to, 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 to hit that, that upper bound of maybe half a percent to one percent, and we start to see prices continue to rise. Bill, we've got to talk about China then. How big is China and what is going on right now? A factor Perhaps, in what you're discussing. I think that's absolutely critical because everyone is looking at China as a leading indicator for where we're going. China came out of COVID fairly uh, early, uh, but right now they're suffering the consequences of their policies, which is every time they see a rise in cases, they shut down the economy and that kills any kind of growth. And right now, the fear is that the Delta variant is going to cause China to shut down yet again and, and cause growth to, to fall way below where their planned targets are. You see the central bank and the fiscal authorities putting in place a lot of insurance policies to bolster any kind of fall, uh, fallback in consumption, which is really the weakest sector in China right now. Is there a track record that shows they can do that? Can they succeed at policy to boost and sustain consumption? One advantage of a command economy is they'll be able to boost public consumption, but the disadvantage is that people don't have the confidence that it's really safe to go back to work, and, and people will not be going out to the restaurants. The people in, in the cities of Shanghai, Guangdong, uh, and Shenzhen are going to stay at home and say, hey, it's not safe to go out. So, so we have a split in China where public consumption, public investment is pushing like crazy. They're, they're financing it with a lot of debt, but the private sector really isn't following through. Bill, great to hear from you, as always. William Lee there. Milken Institute chief economist. And Tom, this is the debate of the moment, isn't it? If you focus on the American economy, there was a sign on Friday that we had that first sign in hopefully a series of monthly jobs reports that the supply was arriving. Demand great, supply would respond in the coming months. The news out of China less encouraging, much, much less encouraging over the weekend, Tom. Well, you're going to get a global feel to it. I mean, Indonesia or China or whatever. I mean, with the Delta variant, there's some huge disparities. John, I would look at this as massively glass half full, 832,000 jobs per month over the last 90 days. And I'm seeing research notes like Lori Calvacina, I thought, had the best note over the weekend where she says, look, it is moving so fast, our growth 
growthiness is going to click in here sooner than we think. And she Tom, directly pushes against Abramowitz. In the future, Tom, she's looking for more chop, though, that we're not going to get this leadership handoff that's going to stick for several yeah. years. It's going to be back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That's a difficult market. It's a difficult market. Well, I don't know. It's great for those that want the vol. It's always there. But again, I look at a general tone here, John, of optimism off that report. What Jason Furman said was great. It's a wonderful report. Go with it. Look at America, Lisa, glass half full. Look at China right now, glass half empty. Let's give some numbers to that, right? So the factory gate inflation that we got over uh, overnight in China surged 9% in July. You saw cons uh, core consumer prices rise the most in 18 months. And what this really raises is how can Chinese officials cut rates further to stimulate growth or even to stabilize some of the financial market turmoil that we've seen recently if you have inflation pressure? Meanwhile, you have people who are actually slowing their purchases because of Delta, because of the higher prices. It's not stagflation, but that is the concern here is that it will crimp growth the more that this dynamic plays out and the more that these lockdowns persist. And really, how much this feeds out into the global economy is something that people don't have a sense of yet, John. And to be more specific, it's about whether we get a second wave of tightness rushing through supply chains again, Tom, given what's happened in China what are you on over the, the last of couple of weeks. Are Not you at all. I think that's the key risk right I, now. I, I'm sorry. I think this is great. Michael Darda uh, has a really smart note saying, look, he reaffirms above trend growth. Is it going to be a boom economy? No, John. But again, I go back to the first order condition of GDP. It's good. We'll get our teeth into that, Tom. It is better than good at the moment. Your equity market looks like this. We're down five on the S&P. We're negative a little more than a tenth of one percent. Starting out the trading week, little changed on the S&P 500. Yields come in about a basis point to 128.34 on tens and euro dollar unchanged. Euro dollar 117.59. From New York City this morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg. With the first one news, I'm Ritika Gupta. The infrastructure bill has now cleared its last procedural hurdle in the U.S. Senate. A vote on the final passage could take place as soon as today. The $550 billion bill is the cornerstone of President Biden's economic agenda. If the Senate approves it, the measure then goes to the House. A new report from the world's top climate scientists sees no end to rising temperatures before 2050. The assessment comes from the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It says the planet will keep warming unless there are drastic moves to eliminate greenhouse gas pollution. The UN Secretary General calls the report a code red for humanity. U.S. Infectious Disease Chief Anthony Fauci says booster shots should go soon to people with weakened immune systems. That's a further sign of how the Delta variant keeps shifting the strategies for fighting the pandemic on NBC. Fauci said he supports vaccine mandates at local levels, such as schools and businesses. The highest-ranking aide to embattle New York Governor Andrew Cuomo has resigned. Melissa DeRosa had remained one of Cuomo's staunchest defenders through multiple scandals. She says the last two years have been trying. DeRosa features prominently in the report that accuses Cuomo of sexually harassing 11 women. She was described as a key architect in discrediting Cuomo's accusers. ESPN reports that soccer superstar Lionel Messi has already reached a deal with Paris Saint-Germain. Messi said goodbye to his longtime club Barcelona in an emotional news conference. The club is not renewing Messi's contract because of financial problems. He's widely regarded as the best player of his generation. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Probably it's going to pass. We'll have a vote tonight, uh, 7.30, uh, and then another vote, if you just look at the clock playing out, mm -hmm. sometime on Tuesday. So it could go quicker, but it's going. It's going. We're getting closer. That was Louisiana Senator Bill Cassidy speaking to CNN over the weekend. From New York City this morning, good morning, alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Roberts. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your price action looks like this. We're negative 7, down 7 points on the S&P, negative 0.16%. All-time highs through much of last week on the S&P 500. Yields higher 
through Friday, lower through this morning. We're down by about a basis point or two to 127.83. That range over the past week has just been wide, wide, wide. It's been huge. And Tom, just to round things out, Euro dollar not doing much. Euro dollar 117.56. Story of the morning, where the price action is, Tom, it's in the commodity market. Crude down to 65, 65.50 on WTI. Yeah, we're watching oil there. We'll get to that in a bit here. Gold with some dynamics as well. It's going to be an interesting week. I like what John said again, folks, at the very top. The tradable readjustment is really profound off what we saw Friday uh, in jobs. It's August in Washington, which means it's silly season. Leading the headlines at the Washington Post is fallout boy will not appear at the National Stadium with Green Day and a bunch of others. Anne-Marie Horton absolutely crushed to meet the totally lads from fallout boy. I mean, it's really <laughs> bad. But what it does come down to, Anne-Marie, is we got to move from the Senate to the House. Is it perceived in Washington that the Senate exercise on infrastructure is basically a waste of time? Because all they're going to do is get to the House and face huge uh, uh, stumbling blocks? It's a good point, Tom. I don't think people view it as a waste of time because obviously you do need a number of steps in Washington, D.C. in order for any sort of plans to get to legislation. But I see the point you are making. Already we see House members that are moderate Democrats circulating a letter over the weekend to Speaker Pelosi saying the second the Senate passes this infrastructure agreement, when we are back in session, we need to move on that and also voicing their concerns that the budget resolution, the reconciliation package that the Democrats in the Senate are going to begin working before they go on recess, they say $3.5 trillion right. is just too high for them. What is the power right now of moderate Democrats? It was all over the zeitgeist this weekend, a reaffirmation of what they're doing versus the liberals. What's their actual power that you perceive? Their power right now, Tom, is certainly it is in the Senate in terms of we're going to have a budget resolution come to the floor and then they go out for recess. Then they come back in September and they're going to hammer out the details of that reconciliation. And that is the Democrat only plan. And every single Democrat in the Senate needs to vote for that in order for it to go through. So if you have senators like Joe Manchin of West Virginia or Kirsten Cinema from Arizona, if you have those two senators saying this is just too high for us. It cannot get through. And then that could potentially temper what we are seeing going on in the House. And Maria, as they start to wrangle over all of these details, how much focus is still on the pandemic and the fact that the number of mm -hmm. cases has been rising pretty significantly, particularly in southern states? It's a very good point, Lisa, and we heard from uh, Senator Bill Cassidy just at the top of the program here talking about the uh, timeline for the infrastructure package, but he also was questioned about the pandemic he, uh, during the weekend on the Sunday shows. He comes from very hard-hit Louisiana, and actually he took a very different stance than what we are seeing from the governor of Florida when it comes to masking, saying that if he local health officials are saying that people need to mask up due to high caseloads, and this is especially becoming a massive national debate when you look at schools. Um, he took the other side of that. He said we should listen to our health officials. It is definitely forefront, forefront in Washington, the pandemic twofold okay. as they are trying to negotiate this infrastructure package. You, you mentioned Florida. So Governor Rick DeSantis has come out and actually banned mask mandates in schools, among other places. Yeah. Now there is a Congress uh, member, congressional candidate, who's suing him, saying that, that you know this could potentially hurt people's health. Where is the Republican leadership when it comes to trying to guide on mask mandates as well as vaccination mandates among certain private employers, let alone public ones? It's, bit, it's a bit sporadic when you see you have a governors uh, like DeSantis saying that I actually am prohibiting mask wearing in schools. Arizona taking a similar approach. Um, it's really state by state. I would point to Senator Mitch McConnell, though. He has been incredibly outspoken. He's using some of his funds for election campaign funds to run ads in Kentucky to tell people, I had polio, we had a life-saving vaccine for polio, and that is why we, people were able to overcome that. And he's using that story to try to push um, at least his constituents to get the vaccine. By and large, many Republicans are saying it's time to get the vaccine. Even others who've been on the sideline, like Representative Scalise, even so recently, a few weeks ago, got his first shot. What is the president's to-do list for this sleepy August summer week? <laughs> 
to-do list is certainly going to be, Tom, to make sure he sees that infrastructure agreement go to a final vote. That looks like it's going to get a check. And then, of course, it's down to the budget resolution, um, the reconciliation package when they come back in September. It seems that August, really for the Democrats, is making sure they can shore up the vote um, in terms of uh, when they come back in September to get that package through. This is part of his huge agenda. I would say the second thing to watch out for, and Punchbowl News just released this, um, getting a uh, first look at what Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is going to say. She's actually going to push Congress to go for a bipartisan approach when it comes to the debt ceiling instead of putting it into the reconciliation package. So we cannot forget, we also have the debt ceiling drama percolating here in Washington. Amory, thank you. Down in Washington, D.C., our Washington correspondent, thank you very much. Tom, it's not that sleepy making some progress on an infrastructure package. We got an inflation print in America Wednesday morning. CPI front and center. Yeah, CPI front and center, John, and also front and center, the moderate Democrats. I think it's going to be fascinating to see how that involves in this sleepy August and into September. I think it's all happening quicker, John, sooner than we would normally see in an off year. Inflation front and center for the People's Bank of China as well. They just put out their yeah. second quarter monetary policy report, Tom. They say the PPI surge is short term, likely to slow in the future. They don't use the T word there, but it sounds like, Tom, they're on board. It sounds like they're managing the message. I mean, John, it's all there is. And it, it, as Bill Lee said, it's a command economy. I think that's French for they've got a lot of powers that we don't have. And they'll, they'll do everything they can to keep the job, job economy going. So many of the issues, though, and Lisa, we talked about this a million times, so many of the issues are on the supply side of the economy, not on the demand side of the economy. When we focus on the United States specifically and those supply side issues, they're building again in China, given the additional layer of restrictions we're starting to see across the country. And you raised a really good point, which is what happens if people stay home and they can't go to factories or they can't go to nodes of production of some key staples that are used for everything that we make and everything that we ship. In other words, how much does this exacerbate some of the su supply chain disruptions, which really does kind of point toward perhaps some of the pessimism or skepticism around earnings that were phenomenal from U.S. companies, because how much are they going to continue to continue to grapple with these issues, John? The risk is those temporary issues persist, and they persist into another year. Let's get to the price action for another morning. Good morning. Your equity market looks like this. We're down 8 on the S&P 500. We're negative almost two-tenths of 1%. Your bond market has been all over the place. 112.58 at the lows last Wednesday. Through 130 this morning, briefly. Yields in now. A basis point or two to 127.83. We have got to talk about the commodity market. I'll touch on gold a little bit later in the program, but crude. Down by almost eight percentage points last That's week. That's a big move. Worst weekly loss yeah. of the year, Tom for WTI. We take more weight off. We're down 3.8 percentage points to 65.67. From New York City this morning, getting the trading week started right here on Bloomberg Surveillance. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good Monday morning. Here is the Monday morning price action. Equity futures down eight, negative eight points and off by about two tenths of one percent. Into Monday after Friday, all time highs on the S&P 500 and a nice week of gains following that really, really beautiful, tidy, fantastic, tremendous jobs report. That enough for you, Tom. Switch up the board and get to the bond market. Thank you. Twos, tens and thirties. That jobs report, that upside surprise, unlocking some higher treasury yields. 130.50 on yeah. a 10-year yield in and around the highs of the session. Right now down two to 127.83. is that two-year a big deal? That two-year yield at about 21 basis points becomes a bigger deal into next year, I think, Tom, yeah. when we start to have this real conversation about higher interest rates at the Federal Reserve. And when it comes to the Federal Reserve, now you've brought it up, the tapering story, Tom, it's not about when, it's not about if, it's about whether they can aggressively delink any decision on tapering from any guidance on rates. Yeah. That's what market participants will be interested in. But when you start to talk about higher interest rates, when you start to think about a stronger dollar as we make more progress towards substantial progress at the Federal Reserve, that is a toxic recipe for a really nasty breakfast for gold bulls. Switch up the board and finish on this one. A big gap lower overnight. And when there's a big gap lower overnight and you have no idea what you're talking about, you call it technicals, liquidity. I have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm calling it technicals. I'm calling it liquidity. Tom, there are other big issues around for gold. The fact of the matter is we've had the biggest conversation about inflation in about a generation. And this has done nothing for me through this year. And then when we start to have a conversation about maybe some of that inflation risk fading, gold starts yeah. to gap lower. 
Tom, 1742 on gold right now. We're yeah. negative about 1% in change. Yeah, I think we're data dependent, to say the least, with an important data this week after that uh, jobs report. What we are data dependent on is to understand it's not just about large cap stocks. David Sauerbrey, a too brief a visit this morning with Ancora, their managing director and portfolio manager, on the value of mid caps. David Sauerbrey, let's go to the heart of it right now on the capitalization that's out there. What is the uncommon value right now among small caps? caps, mid caps, and large caps. Tom, if you take the small and mid and put them together, after the weakness from March until recently, they're trading at a relative discount to their large cap siblings by 10 to 15 percent when they're going to grow earnings faster, when real GDP this quarter is likely to still be up better than 10 percent. And you're always able to unlock value in those stocks that have right. Or fewer Wall Street analysts following them, that gives you a pretty good backdrop for uh, small and mid cap stocks to be an investor today. Critically, can you unlock growth with those categories of capitalization? I think it's if it's about growth, it's really looking less at the income statement, always at the statement of cash flows, and where companies are generating very above average free cash flow. And with that cash flow, they're allocating the capital quite well, whether it's share repurchase, increase the dividend, maybe go do a deal. I think companies, from what I've seen in the number of management calls in the last two or three weeks, has been quite robust. So corporate America has successfully passed along higher costs to consumers. That was the takeaway from a second quarter earnings. How long can they continue to do that? In other words, is this pricing power something that they can continue to have? Or are we reaching the edge of how much further consumers will pay these higher prices as some of these employment, unemployment benefits roll off? Lisa, I think the earnings backdrop will still be quite good over the next year. That is, we'll still grow earnings comfortably in excess of 10%. Uh, that, that makes the, the equity market still the place to be. On the inflation side, we're going to watch that inflation number this week. It's been averaging 0.8% for most of the last three or four months. I'm in the camp that relative to Wall Street and heaven forbid, relative to the Federal Reserve, I think inflation will be more of an issue in that type of environment. Stocks are still your best inflation hedge. And maybe you layer in some real assets like commodities to be that bumper uh, when stocks may not be your best inflation hedge. But David, this story has been known for a while. And when we talk to yes. investors, they all say they are looking for companies with pricing power. How much has that already been priced in, the idea that certain companies will be able to withstand higher prices going forward than others? I, I think because Wall Street may be still drinking the Fed's Kool-Aid that this inflation issue will be not a problem at all. There, there's still going to be more pricing power, I think, for, for companies. And in that environment, look at the U.S. consumer. Uh, we talk about debt at the federal level, at the government level. It's a problem. It's not a problem for consumers to be able to absorb some of those prices <clears throat> and spend for the for 55 cents in yeah. debt that you've taken on in the last five years, yeah. they've generated a dollar in personal income. That allows consumers to buy right. stocks uh, uh, like um, uh, Kabord, Katub, which is a uh, spinoff out of Wrangler, Lee Jeans. I think the consumer is still going to fare quite well. Right. David, real quick, one question. You have been heroic on avoiding the single-digit gloom of equities. You've been dead on. What are you telling pension people right now? Is it a single-digit, low single-digit actuarial world, or can you be more optimistic 10 years out? I think if, if you're looking at U.S. domestic equities, because I wonder why you ever want to own international developed at times, I think in the U.S. domestic world, it's probably an 8% <clears throat> environment, and if you're a good generator of alpha and excess return, then you're pushing closer to 10%. Right. David, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. David Sarby with Ancora out in the Midwest uh, this morning. John, I don't know this story. You know this story. The video speaks volumes. This kid out of Argentina was 13 when he went to Barcelona. John, we don't do that in America. And 21 years later, Tom, he's got to leave. And it comes down to one thing comes down to money. We've got to catch up with a Real Madrid fan, Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo. Maria, aside from the fact that you're probably happy about this, that the talisman of Barcelona has got to leave, walk me through what's happened here. We've gone from Super League in European football 
to no Super League in European football and Barcelona can't keep hold of its star. Yeah, John, and you know what? I'm actually not that evil. I, I, I do feel bad because uh, yesterday this was very moving. You know, you could really tell that this is someone that has made a career in, in Barcelona that really also wanted to stay. In fact, uh, you mentioned why did this happen? Of course, it's money. You know, the team said we cannot afford to pay for this fee. It's too expensive. But he did reveal something that he was willing to take a 50% cut on his contract. So it does wonder or makes you wonder why did it not happen? You know, aside from the money of course this is of course uh, telling us two things one is uh, that the contracts are becoming so expensive that even if you're a very successful team you're not able to pay it and then uh, two of course that they are very badly managed you know a lot of this comes down to Barcelona being really badly managed the fact that you're not able to keep your star player because of money you're one of the most successful teams in the world it does tell you a few things about just how badly run you've been step up Paris Saint-Germain how can PSG make this work, Maria, and Barcelona can't? Well, no, no, it's, it's the fair play rules from the league. When you play in Spain, the league says you have to only spend up to a certain amount of money, and then after that, you're not able to do it. Barcelona, of course, was hoping that they could sell a few players, that they could get transfer fees from a number <coughs> of players, and that meant that Messi could stay on. You also have to factor, John, that Barcelona is in really bad terms with the regulator of the Spanish league because of the Super League itself. Right. And Paris is much easier because the same rules do not apply, okay. so they do have the money to spend spend for Messi. Nobody in America cares. All we care about, John, is Sunday morning, Saturday morning, Premier League, 7 a.m. John, it's all about TV. We know that with the Olympics as well. What does this mean for TV? Does PSG get bigger TV because he goes there, or is it still just about the Premier League? I think there will be more eyes on the French League because of this, Tom, and we'll go through the PSG team in just a moment. But for La Liga, we've got to talk about La Liga, Maria. Cristiano Ronaldo's gone from Real Madrid. Why do I want to watch Real Madrid? Sergio Ramos has gone from Real Madrid. He's brutal. Barcelona, Lionel They're Messi's cruel. gone. The only signing I can see over the summer is Sergio Aguero on a free. Why do I want to watch La Liga this season? <laughs> and is that going to be a problem in the years to come? Look, and the fact that that's a big star coming to play Madrid uh, or to Spain tells you a lot. You know, it's not been a good summer and it's not uh, been a good year for the Spanish teams. You know, you make a very good point. Who is going to watch this? You know, when you think about a Clasico, it's always about Ronaldo versus Messi. One is playing in Italy. The other one is going to play in France. Intrinsically, that is going to devalue yeah. the Spanish league. It also shows that the strategy hasn't really paid off. Remember, this was about having one star player that would carry the team. In fact, it shows that you should not do that. You know, it's better to diversify. We have players that may be good on the field, but none of them have that star quality. And the teams are very much built around one man, yeah, John, Messi and Ronaldo for Real Madrid. Why can't Messi go to the English teams? I mean, if Man City's paying all that for Graylish, why can't somebody in London or, you know, whatever buy Messi? The question, of course, Tom, is whether he wants to. He was pictured okay. with some of his friends from PSG, I think in Ibiza over the weekend. Tom or going into the weekend. So whether he wants to or uh, not. John, and he gets to team up with his best friend Neymar. You never talked to me or Lisa that way. You were cruel to Maria. In, in what way? You're, you're just, I wasn't cruel just, to Maria. You're just trashing on her. I love I mean, Maria. It's great to catch up with Maria. Cruel. I didn't hear that. Maria Tadeo, thank you. What's Maria, he talking you about, upset? Maria? Maria's not upset. No. Maria, thank you very much. Just, What's he you, talking Maria. about? No idea. Thank you. Maria's made a strong stuff, Tom. She BA. is. PSG, yeah. that lineup. I'm trying to think of what the comparison would be in American sports. Please. To have that lineup, Tom, of Neymar and Mbappe and the likes of Messi up front, Verratti in behind, Sergio Ramos in defense. So they would be better than Man Donna City. Donna in defense. That's starting 11, yeah. In terms of the stars, But then absolutely. who do they play? Who does PSG play? Well, that's the issue, isn't it? Not many big I don't names, know. Tom. I'm asking. They don't. I mean, they, a lot of people are quite unfriendly about the French League and call it a farmer's league, Tom. Yeah. I, I don't endorse that view of things, but yes, at a league level, they're not going to have to pay, play many people. It's at the Champions League level where things will be interesting. Can they finally win that elusive Champions League at Paris Saint-Germain? I don't know, are we, Jack. are we done here? No, we're not on? done. I, you know, I, I do think it's... Jack. Look, Tom, we spent the start of this year talking about a European Super League. Yeah. And the clubs involved, Barcelona, Real Madrid, Juventus, yeah. they still wanted to make okay. it happen. They've hardly spent yeah, any money this summer. Michael Givens went to the Cincinnati Reds. That's Is that the big trade? That's a huge, That's the big trade. huge deal. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, Tom King, Lisa Bravitz, Jonathan Ferro. A special thanks to Maria Tadeo for joining us on the latest. I'll I can say, tell you that PSG Maria, has you. hired out the Eiffel Tower for August 10th. 
I think there might be an announcement brewing, don't you? Your yes, bond sir. market, 127.50 on 10. We should tens. go road trip. Yields in a couple of basis points. I knew that was what this was about. Road Peaches trip. down two tenths on the s and coverage. For the start of League 1. Can't wait, Tom. I think it's already started. From New York, this is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Rishka Gupta. The U.S. Senate could pass that $550 billion infrastructure package as soon as today. Lawmakers moved a step closer to a final vote by agreeing to limit debate on the measure. 18 Republicans joined with all 50 senators who caucus with the Democrats. It's an indication of bipartisan support for the bill. And the Biden administration faces the reality that returning to the Iran nuclear deal may no longer be feasible. U.S. officials are reviewing their options after months of talks on re-entry into the accord failed to produce an agreement. Iran has found ways to cope with U.S. sanctions and it's racing towards the capacity to build a nuclear bomb. And it's a victory for Norwegian Cruise Line and its vaccine requirement. A preliminary court injunction will allow Norwegian to require proof of coronavirus vaccination as a condition of boarding its ships in Florida. A recent state law in Florida bans vaccine requirements. That law has been put on hold for now. And Alibaba has fired a manager accused of rape. China's largest e-commerce company is trying to contain the fallout after an employee's account of her ordeal went viral. The story has ignited debate about rampant sexism in China's tech industry. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. worry about the day uh, when a variant arises that is so different from the original Wuhan virus that basically the vaccines stop working as well and then we have to really move forward quickly with the booster. The best way to prevent that from happening is to reduce the number of infections because that's how mutants happen. Dr. Francis Collins there, the National Institute of Health Director on ABC's This Week from New York City this morning. Good morning. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Is the price action down eight on the S&P? We're negative two-tenths of one percent. Record highs, all-time highs at a close on Friday. As the week progresses, it gets a little bit more interesting. CPI on Wednesday, the main event for many people watching this economy. Lisa went through the Fed speak a little bit earlier. Bostick, Barkin speaking a little bit later. 127.67 is your yield on tens, Tom. Yields are in a couple of basis points, and crude is lower by four percentage points to 65.59. Commodities heading south. I don't know what the Fed people are going to say, John, out to September 22nd. Boy, do they have to look at the data, including, John, the next jobs report. The next jobs report, September 3rd, Tom. Yeah. August 11th, we get the CPI read. So CPI, then onto jobs, and then yeah. another CPI print before we get to, when is it, Tom? September 22nd. September your 22nd, decision. just after the eyes of September. By the eyes of September, let's call it the 15th of the month. Month, we're going to have a lot of good knowledge about this new pandemic or this new part of this pandemic in schools. Everybody's got their calendar for the Keene household. It's 30 days and counting. Others, it's much shorter. Joshua Sharfstein joins from Johns Hopkins. Joshua, what are pros doing when they look at the new conundrum of getting schools launched in classroom? I think they're looking at the data, which show that if you have multiple mitigation measures in place, you're in the best possible position to prevent illnesses for teachers, other adults in school, and students. And those measures are going to include masks for teachers and students, vaccines for all the adults and, and older kids who can, can take them, and uh, better ventilation, a few other things. Um, and if you do those things, you're really minimizing the chance of a problem, probably to a point where it's quite low. We're obviously going to have to see how this plays out. What's very disturbing to me is how some school boards, though, are acting like the virus is really not that much of a threat and, the, and they could be sorely mistaken. What do you think is the remedy, given the fact that it seems to be a state-by-state state kind of endeavor at this point, with Florida actually banning mask mandates in schools and others saying that we need to wear masks and, frankly, that teachers need to get vaccinated? Well, you're seeing some school boards in Florida and elsewhere look themselves in the mirror and say, do we put the health of children first? 
And if, this, if they are, say yes to that simple question, do we put the health of children first, they're following what the CDC says, they're following what the nation's pediatricians, the American Academy of Pediatrics say, and they're requiring masks in school. And they're doing it in defiance of state, of state law in some cases, but frankly, they're doing it to save uh, serious illnesses among the children that they are responsible for. Given the fact that you focus on public health, how important is it for kids to go back in person to school when you look at some of the studies that talk about depression and anxiety in so many kids, the fact that they've fallen behind in so many different areas during remote schooling, which by many accounts failed? I mean, how important is it for them to get back in the classroom in a consistent way? I think it's extremely important, which is why we should do everything for that to be as safe as possible. Um, you know, it was a year ago, actually, a few weeks ago, a little bit over a year ago, that um, I co-authored a piece in the Journal of the American Medical Association talking about all the harms when kids are not in school. And there are many. It's not just anxiety and depression, although that's a huge one. It's not enough food to eat. It's the potential um, poor recognition and mistreatment um, because so many uh, kids are recognized as being abused in school. There are so many reasons for kids to go back to school, but we have to do it safely. And frankly, the school boards, the right. superintendents, the principals who are not standing up for the health of kids are really doing a disservice, and they may come to regret it seriously. And Dr. Sharfstein, how does a given fifth grader get sick from COVID versus adults? I mean, basically, they get sick the same way. They get exposed um, often from somebody who is not masked, and they um, will uh, experience a respiratory illness, you know, and it could be quite severe. We're seeing that there are really three ways for kids to be harmed. Obviously, a very serious illness is a problem, and that could include a stay in the intensive care unit and very rarely even death. Um, but it's also possible to get a immune reaction about a month afterwards that can be quite serious and debilitating with life, lifelong consequences. And then you have long COVID, a uh, big story today about kids who have a brain fog and, and fatigue. It's, you know, maybe as high as about one in 15. I mean, these are all serious consequences. And it's why we have to really look at kids uh, for the health of kids, not compare it to older adults, but just say, like, what if this were just about kids and do the right thing to help kids? Joshua, a couple of months ago, you came out. We said other colleagues of yours are saying that the pandemic is over. We have to move to a post-pandemic reality. You said not so fast. It's not over. Unfortunately, you are more right. And I'm wondering, going forward, when you will say it's over, what will make you say that? Well, I think the key is to watch the number of infections and where they are, and then our understanding of what's going on. At the time that I said that, there were not that many people vaccinated, and all the models were predicting a resurgence. That was even before the Delta variant. And what really mattered was getting vaccination to high levels. If we have protected ourselves through vaccination, and we're seeing the consequences of that in fewer cases, I'll be very excited to say we're, we're really talking about putting uh, the, this pandemic back into a box. It might cause a little bit of damage, but we can really dramatically limit that if we do the things that we know will work. Joshua, good to hear from you. Doctor, thank you. Joshua Shafstein there. Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, Vice Dean. A number to think about, Tom. The average over the past week, the daily average of vaccines administered in this country, 706,323 doses per day. Let's see if that starts to shift, Tom over the next couple of weeks, because many people are starting to see that happen at the state level. Well, again, and just seeing it continue on is half the battle. I saw working numbers 71 percent vaccinated, and clearly the experts are telling us that's not good enough. Lisa, it's not enough. Well, especially because it's uneven. And if you look at where the infections are rising, The New York Times did a great study showing uh, basically the state whether it's above average or below average in vaccination, then the number of cases. And you could see a direct correlation that the fewer people are vaccinated, the more you're seeing an uptick in cases now. And you do wonder how idiosyncratic this becomes. How does a national level target state level uh, parameters?
disparity beneath the surface of the headline numbers for sure. Let's get to the equity market. We're shaping up as follows this Monday as we look down a trading week that really the highlight of it comes on Wednesday. Wednesday is your CPI report in the United States of America. 127.50 on tens yields are in a couple of basis points in the FX market. A snooze for euro dollar. Euro dollar 117.55. President Weidman sounding like President Weidman. That quote, the first P in sure. the pandemic emergency purchase program stands for pandemic and not for permanent. It's a question of credibility. Just President shock. Weidmann in a German newspaper this morning. Euro dollar 117.55. Look out below crude. Down by almost eight percentage points last week and now negative 4.28% to 65.35 on WTI. And some concerns about what happens next. Not in America, but in China. We'll get our teeth into that in the next hour from New York City. This is Bloomberg. The economy, the empty cubicles that you've seen across the country, it is not stopped. Now it's time to sort of pull back both the fiscal as well as the monetary stimulus. The Fed's being very clear they want to avoid the taper tantrum. It's going to take a long time to get it back to a normal level. We are expecting that the market will end the year lower rather than higher. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. All-time highs into Monday from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Futures a little bit softer, lighter, lower. We're down two-tenths of 1% on the S&P, but it's all-time highs Friday and a series of upgrades, Tom, over the past week on this U.S. equity market as well. Yeah, I think that's the place to go, John. The view forward for the strategist is simple. Great jobs report, great economy. It confirms a lot. 832,000 is a three-month moving average in non-farm payrolls. And when are we going to get out to 5,000? thousand SPX. We're not there yet, but when? The labor market is healing. Demand is there, Tom. We've been talking about that all year. Supply starting to arrive. Can we say the same about what is happening in China? And I keep going back to it. We had downgrades last week from the Mora into the weekend. We've had them from Goldman and JP Morgan as well. They're starting to pile up. <clears throat> Yeah, they're starting to pile up. The benchmark there is 6%, John. As a cardinal rule, 3% growth is a recession in China. I don't hear people talking that, but they are modeling out below a 6% growth, and that demands a government response from Beijing. Well, let's talk about it. Lisa, you can talk about levels or you can talk about direction of travel. We're moving the wrong way, but the levels in China, Goldman's still looking for an eight handle. Full year for GDP in China. Mm -hmm. That ain't bad. It ain't bad. However, it's also coming as they try to shift their economy in a way uh, away from some of the fast growth leveraged fueled uh, activity that we saw over the past decade or two and into something more sustainable and catering more to uh, the, the average mom and pop investor, the average mom and pop consumer and trying to even that out. That is going to necessarily slow growth. So they need the underlying growth to be faster than perhaps it otherwise would be. So far, this equity rally has been sustainable over the last year. That's for sure. Let's get into the price action. Your equity market shaping up as follows on the S&P 500 futures this morning. Just a little bit softer. We're negative nine on the S&P and down two tenths of one percent into the bond market where we have been all over the place as low as 112.58 on tens last Wednesday as high as 130.50 this morning. Yeah. 127.50 right now Tom in a couple of basis points. Uh, to me the bond market's contained John. I look at the real yield the 10 year real yield negative 1.09. You would have thought we would have had a better real yield to a lesser negative number off the jobs report. We had we really that, didn't. Tom. Friday, a yeah. bit of that. We had a bit of that. But what did we have off the back of that this morning? Gold lower as the opportunity cost of holding gold starts to bite as real yields adjust. And then, Lisa, you look at the commodity market in response to what's happening maybe in China. Commodities suffering. Metals, copper down 1.3, crude down by four percentage points. Which really raises, again, the question is their dissonance right now between what we're seeing in oil prices, lower, fear of a slowdown because of the increase in Delta cases, and low 10-year yields, albeit somewhat higher than they were last week. Are these sending a negative message that equities aren't getting, or is there something else at play here? Just to talk about the data aspect, I'm going to throw out a number, 9.27 million jobs. That is how many job openings there may be at 10 a.m. that get revealed in June. That is the U.S. JOLTS job openings data. That would be a record. The idea here is those frictions are persisting and getting worse in terms of employees uh, not being able to find 
uh, or employers rather, not being able to find the employees that they need. Also today, we'll talk about substantial further progress, perhaps Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic, Richmond Fed President uh, Tom Barkin, both speaking at 10 a.m. and noon, respectively, going to hear what they have to say about the labor market report that by all accounts was way better than good. And today, just to talk about the progress in the pandemic, Hong Kong is planning to open its borders to some vaccinated foreigners, including from the United States and Canada, and fully vaccinated United States residents will be allowed into Canada for the first time. The key question, of course, is when is the U.S. going to open its borders to foreign, uh, foreigners who have full vaccinated status? Still a question mark on that, John. Reciprocity is a bit of an issue when you try and do these things. Lisa, thank you. We'll leave that one there. Thank you very much. Let's bring in Brian Levitt, Invesco Global Market Strategist. Brian, I'll characterize your view for you just briefly, and then you can give me the latest. I understand you're looking for that return to trend growth through next year. We'll make that progress towards trend, and you're looking for growth to take over in terms of leadership. Any challenge to that from the data over the past week, Brian? I think maybe over some weeks, but not necessarily over some years. So, Jonathan, when you think of where the 10-year was at 112 and a move back up to 128, I wouldn't be surprised to see further improvements in this economy as we get more American adults vaccinated. And so should rates be at 128? Probably not. Um, could they be somewhat higher than here? Yeah. And in that environment, then cyclicals and value-oriented parts of the market will do well. My point is to say that it's, we're ultimately going to stabilize uh, to a, a more modest growth rate. It, it's nothing structural changed. We had a, a disastrous uh, coronavirus-driven recession. We recovered from it, and we're navigating around getting back to a more stable level of growth. So my view is as you're looking out beyond the next weeks or the next couple of quarters, start to contemplate what the structural picture looks like, and it should continue well, to be a, a modest growth environment. Okay, fine. It's a modest growth environment. Michael Darda agrees with you over at MKM Partners in his morning <laughs> note. Great. Brian, what's it mean for corporations? I mean, life goes on. State where the gloom crew has it wrong. So what it means is that growth, it'd be very similar, Tom, to what you saw from the middle of 2011 through the end of 2019, is that growth is strong enough to be supportive of corporate earnings, but it's not so strong that it leads to big excess, significant inflation, you know, meaningful Fed tightening. So it creates a cycle that could go on for some time. Now, some corporations will be better positioned for this than others. If you're a structurally advantaged growth business, similar to what we saw in the last cycle, you're likely to benefit from it. If you're the type of business that requires higher sustained economic activity, then you're unlikely to receive a, a fancy multiple on the type of earnings that you're able to generate. As an investor, do you like this kind of chart that Lizanne Saunders of Charles Schwab put out this morning showing that share buybacks in the United States of the S&P 500 are running at near the fastest pace ever, almost eclipsing 2018? Is that a good thing from your perspective? Well, it certainly tells us that businesses are flush with cash, and it, it certainly tells us that... Um, you know, it, it's certainly a tailwind to markets. Now, would I would I rather see, you know, more businesses use that money to put it to productive use? Sure. But it, it's indicative of a, of a corporate environment that's probably thinking similarly along the same lines that I'm thinking is that, you know, there's we're not going into a robust growth environment and, and they're deploying cash in a way that they think is appropriate as a result of that. I do wonder also, Brian, to what degree those buybacks were delayed from last year into this year. True. Absolutely. I agree with that. That's got to be an issue, Lisa, going forward from here. How can we really take this year's data for things like buybacks and capital returns after the year that we've just had? Yeah, but why do they have money now from uh, after a year like last year? <laughs> they have it because they borrowed all this money and they're using some of that borrowed money to do the share buyback. So I agree with you. It is deferred. However, the fact that we can just go right back to our old plans sure. with a huge gap in the middle of what we missed. But you know better than most that a lot of the money that's been raised in the market has been for refinancing in credit that the debt piles of some of these companies, they've pushed the maturities out, they've lowered rates, and leverage ratios aren't moving in the wrong direction, they're moving in the right direction. All right, so Brian, can you weigh in on that? Because right now we're seeing that certainly in the investment grade universe. It's a little bit different though in the high yield universe, isn't it? Well, yeah, but again, for the most part, these businesses are borrowing this money at very low interest rates. And to Jonathan's point, they've pushed these maturities out. So you're not looking at a wall of maturity. Um, you're not looking at a very onerous interest burden for a lot of these businesses. I mean, it's pretty similar to households for those of us that refinanced. Um, 
you know, you you take advantage yeah. of, a, of these opportunities when they come to you. Brian, the FA mode on Bloomberg tells you a lot about use of cash, about share buyback. Just as one example, and I don't mean to pick on Amazon other than that their CapEx is, you know, nobody can get a handle on the amount of money Amazon is spending to grow, grow, grow. But from 2019 as the last normal year, there's something on the order of published free cash flow of $22 billion growing out to $25 billion, and then you skip 18 months or whatever because of the pandemic, and the new working number in the future is $45 billion. <laughs> and now, Amazon's Amazon. But that permeates through the Invesco system, doesn't it? It does. And, and again, it's back to talking about these advantage businesses and these businesses that can generate cash flow in these types of an environment. And, and if you think about where we are, yeah, if corporations have used the, the low um, interest rate environment to borrow money, but also think about what's going on in the earnings picture. It's not as if this hasn't been a good fundamental story for businesses. We're coming through a very robust earnings quarter. Um, as pent up demand came back into the economy, I, I don't think that we don't continue to see earnings and uh, grow at these at these levels. But you know, back to my original point, a, a more stable growth environment can still be very supportive of corporate earnings. It can still be very supportive of those businesses that can generate cash flow. Brian, good to catch up with you. Thank you. As always, Brian Levitt, Invesco Global Market Strategist. At the headline level in America, corporate America looks pretty resilient, pretty tidy, pretty decent right now. I'm much more concerned about how things flow out of China from a credit perspective as well. When we caught up with Damien Sassan in the last couple of weeks, these two stats just jumped out to me and I keep repeating Please. them. China makes up 25%, more than 25% yeah. of all dollar-denominated EM bonds trading above 7%. China makes up two-thirds of the distressed EM universe. We need to watch out what happens there. Can it stay isolated or does it start to bleed, start to flow back through not just the economy, yeah. but through markets too? It's really, really important, John, that overweight to China versus what was in the textbooks when we were younger is a, a, a massive change. I would suggest that some of those worries, though, John, can impart a disinflationary tendency on the inflation worries in the United States. I'm not sure how that math works out. But, you know, I just don't share the gloom for the United States from what we see that's tangible on the Pacific Hasn't climate. that been the change, though, Tom, that China <clears throat> was a source of disinflation and now is a source potentially of higher prices? I can't prices. disagree with that. That I seems to be the change. This morning, yeah. lower prices in commodities, and we need to catch up with Ed Moore, City Head of Commodities Probably Research. We'll do that in the next hour. I haven't commented on that yet, Tom. No, Ed 65 28. Only reason, on reason Ed Morse is coming out down is down 4%. The man from Del Monte makes a comeback, but I feel like this is something to do with President Biden's Got suit on right. Friday. Are you in support base, of the base, of a base suits, suit? John, are normal in the summer. Okay. Of a certain they're age? normal. Yeah, they're of okay, a... Okay, certain yeah. vintage. They're, John, <laughs> you would style in beige. I don't think I would. Paul so. Stewart or whoever that fancy Euro trash you buy. Euro You trash. could style no. in that, John. <laughs> nice. I'm pleased we're you getting on so at, well this morning. You would look at... Are you done? And with your British accent, I mean, you'd be a girl man. No, from New York. He's not. We're going to leave it all there. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Rishka Gupta. A new report from the world's top climate scientists sees no end to rising temperatures before 2050. The assessment comes from the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It says the planet will keep warming unless there are drastic moves to eliminate greenhouse gas pollution. The report comes three months before the UN's International Climate Talks, called the Conference of the Parties 26. COP26 is very critical. Obviously, the scientist does not tell the politicians what to do, but they provide the very basis for people to have an understanding. Today's report is the work of more than 200 scientists. The infrastructure bill has now cleared its last procedural hurdle in the U.S. Senate. A vote on final passage could take place as soon as today. The $550 billion bill is the cornerstone of President Biden's economic agenda. If the Senate approves it, the measure then goes to the House. U.S. Infectious Diseases Chief Anthony Fauci says booster shots should go soon to people with weakened immune systems. That's a further sign of how the Delta variant keeps shifting the strategies for fighting the pandemic. On NBC, Fauci said he supports vaccine mandates at local levels, such as schools and businesses. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg.
we're seeing our economy moving forward. Uh, we're seeing people going back into all sectors. I think in some sectors, we're definitely going to need to see higher wage growth for people to come back to work. Uh, but, but I think where we're headed right now, I mean, all signs are incrementally going in, in a good positive direction. Murray Walsh there, good to catch up with the US Secretary of Labor after the payrolls report Friday, a really strong one. Most people agree with that. I think everyone agrees with how tremendous that report was. From New York City this morning, good morning. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures on the S&P were negative seven, call it down eight. We're down two tenths of one percent on the S&P 500. Yields are coming in a couple of basis points, just a little bit defensive off the back of some downgrades on the outlook for Chinese growth. Nomura last week, then JP Morgan, then Goldman. Your 10 year, 127. 733. We'll talk a little bit more about crude in just a moment. 65.55. Crude is down four percentage points. But Tom, let's look at that report. The latest scientific assessment from the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is 200 scientists <coughs> digesting thousands of yeah. studies. It's the sixth global science assessment from this group since 1990. And Tom, we haven't had one for more than eight years. And this is the quote that's going to stand out. It will be the lead quote, I imagine, in several publications around the world. In fact, many publications around the world. And here it is. It is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean and land. Tom, that's the headline from yeah. that particular study. I was able to attend Paris with Francine Lacroix and John. It is just miles from 2015 and the good feeling of Paris. To me, John, the two observations are the United States and what are we going to do, whatever anybody's politics is, and the other is the coal uses in China. John, I'm sorry, there's no other issue. Yeah, the headline finding, here it is. The past decades was most likely hotter than any period in the last 125,000 years. And yeah. you're right to pick on China, Tom, or pick China out. That's where the tension's going to be. It has been over the last several years and will yeah, be well, for many, many decades still to come. Yeah, Elizabeth Economy at Council on Foreign Relations is, de uh, de uh, is definitive on this, back to where a river runs black. And the answer is the river still runs black, John. I mean, you can talk, talk, talk all you want, and, and frankly, I'm voicing uh, uh, Secretary Kerry here. The basic idea is we can do all this mumbo jumbo. You got to go after the blunt instrument of the big topic, and the big topic is coal and China. And for the Biden administration, what does that mean politically, Tom? I, it's it's you know, that's a good question, John. I'm going to let experts talk about that. But to me, it's the middle ground of this nation trying to sway both sides hugely. Polarized. What we saw with the administration in the UK, the government there, they saw this as a bridge to build with the new incoming administration in the United yeah, States yeah. on climate change. China, I think, was almost trying to do the same thing, Tom, for a moment in time. For a moment in time. And yeah. I wonder if that's got traction going through the rest of this year. Yeah, I'm glad you bring up the United Kingdom. They've got a really interesting place in this. It'll be something to discuss here coming off this important uh, report. Right now, we discuss the uh, bridges over troubled waters. Talk about the 50th anniversary of Simon and Garfunkel. Emily Wilkins doesn't know who Simon and Garfunkel is, but she knows political <laughs> waters when she sees it. Emily, just give me the summary of this week in the political swirl known as Washington. So for this upcoming week, we are on track to have that infrastructure bill finally pass the Senate. They took their final procedural vote last night. Republicans joined in with Democrats, giving them more than enough votes. Yeah. Some outstanding questions right now. What's going to happen with the crypto amendment? But look, oh, that's supposed on. to be passed either today, <clears throat> early Tuesday, or sometime Tuesday morning. From there, we go on to that budget resolution, because Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has said that needs to get done before the Senate can finally depart right. Their August recess. What's the character of the first phone call from the senator of New York to the speaker of the House out in San Francisco? What's the first, what's the character of that first phone call? Probably to discuss exactly if they're going to continue their strategy of holding both bills, holding that infrastructure bill until that reconciliation bill comes down the line. Because now Speaker Pelosi is under increased pressure from moderate Democrats in her own party saying, look, we cannot wait for the Senate to move this reconciliation bill. We need to move now on this infrastructure bill. And they do have some leverage, Tom. Remember, and this is going to get a little wonky here, but to pass that budget reconciliation, they need the blueprint of a budget resolution. So that needs to pass the Senate, 
come to the House and pass the House. And we've had heard some rumblings among moderate Democrats saying they will not approve that reconciliation blueprint if they don't see movement on infrastructure. Although at this point, it's unclear exactly how much of this is posturing and how much of this is a very credible threat. So every year we have to deal with the debt ceiling farce. We have to deal with this wrangling, will we or won't we default on the American debt load? And everybody has to consider it and price it in vaguely to three month T-bills. This year, uh, there is a question of whether that reconciliation reconciliation bill will get tossed into the debt ceiling limit debate. What is uh, the political weight on that issue right now? Lisa, this is the one question that everyone's been asking, particularly to Senator Bernie Sanders, the chair of the Budget Committee. Are you going to include a raise to the debt ceiling in the budget resolution? He hasn't really given a straightforward answer yet. There's a lot of debate on that. Also hearing this morning from uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, who's saying, look, this needs to be a bipartisan effort. Republicans and Democrats need to come together to raise that debt ceiling, just like they did during the Trump administration. However, uh, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell McConnell, top Republican in the Senate, has said that's a no-go, that Republicans will not be voting with Democrats to raise that debt ceiling, pointing to the amount of money that's already been spent by the federal government in the last year and additional concerns about inflation. Emily, thank you. Got to leave it there. Emily Wilkins of Bloomberg Government, thank you very much. Tom, just pouring through the UN's intergovernmental panel on climate change, the release of this report that they've put out this morning. And for our audience, if you're just tuning in, the conclusion, this quote, it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean and land. Some of the words that came from Antonio Gutierrez, Tom, the Secretary General of the UN, the document is, quote, a code red for humanity. And this is an important one for markets, too, and for certain sectors, and I'm thinking of energy. Here's the quote right here, Tom. This report must sound a death knell for coal and fossil fuels before they destroy our planet. And as we know, Tom, it is not that yeah. simple, but that's the challenge that is posed right now for a sector that has done tremendously well in this equity market so far year to date. Yeah, John, I'm just going to listen to experts. I'm going to listen to Michael Mann out of Penn State. He's wonderful. Mark Maslin owns a high ground in the United Kingdom. I'll put out on Twitter today, folks, this very short read on climate change. People got to get basic knowledge on this before they dive in with their personal politics. Uh, completely, Tom. And I'd go one step further. It's not just about governments respond to this. Lisa, it's how corporate America, the C-suite, response to some of this too. Well, and you're hearing this. I mean, we heard that in the earnings reports of how uh, oil companies tried to indicate that they were being forward-looking with respect to the new phase of energy. I do think this is interesting, especially in light of what Emily Wilkins was talking about, the infrastructure bill in Washington, D.C. How much is going to building a greener infrastructure? How much is actually going to the oil industry? And those breakdowns have been trickling out, John. Speaking of all, right now, Brent at 68 handle on crude. We're down by 3.7 percent, been lower on WTI by around about four percentage points. WTI right now negative 3.94 percent to 65.59. And the equity market shaping up as follows on the S&P 500. Futures look like this, negative six off the lows of the session and down by 0.14 percent. Yields have been all over the place over the last week. 127.67 on tens right now. Yields in a couple of basis points. And euro dollar not doing much at all. Euro dollar 117.62. The next big stop for this market comes on Wednesday. It is US CPI. That report comes Wednesday morning. Alongside Tom Keane, Lisa Brabitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Heard on radio, seen on TV. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide on TV and radio, this is Bloomberg Surveillance and here's the price action. We're negative six on the S&P, down a little more than a tenth of one percent. Lisa's been counting. It's been frustrating for her. 190 days since we had a five percent drawdown on the S&P 500. Lisa, we'll keep guaranteed. counting. Yes. NASDAQ futures positive about <laughs> a tenth of one percent on the NASDAQ this morning. We're doing OK. No drama here whatsoever. If you switch up the board and get to the bond market, twos, tens and thirties. It's been a bit of drama there over the last week. 112.58 oh, in the lows on very... Wednesday. 130.50 something at the highs this morning. 127.67 is where we are at the moment. Down about two basis points on the day on tens. On thirties, a similar amount. The 30 year back to 192.90. Let's set the stage though for the debate right now. Switch up the board and get to crude. Crude is having a rough, tough, ugly morning. We're lower, we're down, we're softer on crude by 
65.45, that's the number. We're down by, where are we? Let me see, by a little more than four percentage points on WTI right now. Tom, you can look to the US and say, glass half full, payrolls are fantastic. Or you can look to China and say, downgrades are coming, Goldman, <laughs> JP Morgan, yeah. Nomura, all cutting their forecasts. I wouldn't look at the demand side of the equation, I'd look to supply. Tons of demand in this economy at the moment. We've seen that in the labor market. Payrolls starting to build, supply starting to respond, good news. Two ways of looking at things, Tom, into year end. Either you believe supply will start to ease, those constraints will heal going into year end, or you believe we might get a second wave of this, another shock that runs through the system. More supply constraints, more delays coming off the back of what's happening in China. So, Tom, they're the two ways of looking at it. Demand's great, supply response, fantastic. Will that continue I, into year end? Or I, do you get a second shock, a second wave that comes out of China? You're on the edge of a Bramo. It's almost again. there. I mean, I mean I'm name check Lisa too. It. You knew where I was going, Tom. John, John, I mean, it's just, God, you're just sitting too close. You've got to you gotta move your it's podium that bad. closer we're together. We're about 10 feet I mean, apart, Join Tom. us. 10 feet apart. Yeah, I don't know why we're not I all in the not same room. I try not to have room, an opinion. John, <laughs> try not to have an opinion. Get to Romaine and then we'll go optimistic. I'm going to do that. Don't worry. Crude okay. right now, 65.42. We're down a little more than 4%. Let's get you some movers. Here is Romaine. Save us, Romaine. Hey, good morning, John, Tom, and Lisa. I'm going to pick up uh, where you left off, John, because a lot of the big movers today, of course, are in the commodity space. You talk about some of the concerns right now with crude oil and the demand uh, out of China, of course, tied to the Delta variant here. You're looking at WTI, of course, below that 66 bucks a level, uh, accidental lower here on the morning. Devon Energy also moving a little bit lower, as are most of the other oil and exploration stocks. You're also seeing some of that similar pessimism uh, creep into the base metal space. Freeport, McMoran, the big copper miner, that's down. You're looking at copper prices, nickel, and all of the base metals lower here uh, early this morning. And then, of course, the flip side of that, of course, has to do with the relative U.S. strength and, of course, the potential reaction function of the Fed uh, to last Friday's jobs report. That's pushing Newmont mining and the rest of gold lower here on the day. Newmont down about 1%. And we should point out spot gold right now uh, trading below $1,700 announced that of course that's after wow. punching through 1900 just a couple of months ago so we've completely flip-flopped and gone in the opposite direction now outside of the commodity space a few individual stories to keep an eye on in the M&A space keep an eye on Invitae of course this is the big uh, genetic uh, sequencing company that's back uh, by Kathy Wood and her ARK Investment Funds. They own about 11% of this. Exact Science is said to have made an offer for the company. This based on Bloomberg reporting. The companies have not confirmed that, but the shares are higher here, about 8% here in the pre-market. Coinbase is going to be in the news this week as well, Tom. They were actually reporting tomorrow. BitDog actually higher here on the day, making a nice run above yes. 45000 AMD, keep an eye on this space. It actually had a nice rally last week, hitting that record high right. on Wednesday. It did peel back a little bit, getting a little bit of a bid this morning. BMO actually upgrading here uh, to neutral. Romain Basic yeah. to close. Look for that this afternoon. Some of the nuances of Monday uh, trading. Right now, and this is important, with a well-timed headline out moments ago, Tyson's Foods, which is really part of the barometer of this nation with a revenue upgrade. That's all you need to know to get to Michael Purvis of Tallback and Capital. Michael, buried in your note, there's way too much revenue optimism. Why does the gloom crew misjudge the revenue optimism that you see? Well, I think in part because there was a – in Q2, we had a series of economic data that underperformed the expectations here. But, again, that's uh, – it gets a little bit into this notion that the U.S. Uh, economy is not completely reflective of what happens in the S&P 500 uh, revenue and earnings streams there. So um, I, I think that's part of it. But I also think it's a real testament to the fact that corporations, um, you know, in 2020 when the storm hit, were really pretty good at – navigating through that and uh and you know as the economy is recovering i think they've also been proven to be pretty um agile uh maneuverers of this uh you know tricky economic uh, condition um there um and then of course you have some of the backdrop like stock buybacks have been a you know an, an important source of uh what you could call synthetic earnings growth to help uh, you know smooth things out as well of course that doesn't doesn't help the top line there as well. But I, look, I, at the end of the day, um, I, I think the corporate earnings are, are it's an interesting contrast with the earnings and revenues beats in this quarter, uh, the, the second quarter, um, where the economic data has really sort of underperformed. Um, it's a real testament to the corporations. Until Friday, when payrolls really started to come back in a big way. Big concern, Michael, I think, for a lot of people. Margins look great now. Can we continue to insulate those margins if these supply constraints persist into year-end? Do you share that confidence, Mike? Well, 
Um, look, I, I think two things, one of which is that, um, you know, here we are, we're more than halfway through the year. If, there, if the margin misses are because of supply chain issues, um, because, uh, you know, Ford can't sell cars because of the chip shortage, um, uh, you know, if, if, it, if, it's, if it's related to those facets, I'm not particularly worried because I think that ultimately means people will buy, a, you know, a Ford truck or car in 2022, which frankly, is really what the market needs to look at is a stronger 22 right now. If it's really because of something, if the margin misses are because of it's something, you know, really because of some, you know, uh, more structural forces uh, uh, related to 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 sustained um, uh, cost in, uh, increases, particularly uh, labor. Um, that that's going to be different. But I think, again, that conversation, John, is extraordinarily company and sector specific, right? Um, you know, if you look at big cap tech earnings, they've had uh, wage pressures. Uh, you know, they have to pay very high pos- high programs and so forth, very high wages, uh, really, since their company's foundings there. Um, so, it, you know, whereas, whereas companies like Walmart, for example, uh, are going to be much more vulnerable there. But I don't know if we really have the data yet on – how whether whether the margin compression even at the very uh, economically sensitive um, sectors are yeah. are, are it's going to be that problematic. Michael, uh, just to build on this, several. Michael, just to build on John's point here, there is an argument that consumers have been more willing to absorb higher costs because their savings are so bloated from the checks they've gotten from the government, from not going on vacations. However, that tolerance will fade over time as those savings get eaten down and they can start spending on more things and and experiences. Do you buy that, that it will become harder for companies to pass along higher costs, regardless going forward, just simply because the consumer will be more discerning as life returns to normal? That's a very good question, Lisa. Look, I, I think I think again, it's a little bit uh, uh, name specific. Uh, you know, I think there's going to be, um, uh, and 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 it's also about timing too, right? So, like, there's you can look at materials names and like the steel sector, where steel prices have not done the lumber thing of of giving all their gains back. Interesting, that um, lumber they're, thing. They're, right, right, but they're they're very they're very the steel futures curve is very robust throughout uh, 20, 2022 at record, record levels here, right? Yeah. Um, there, so, so the steel companies have been able to pass off, off their um, uh, their higher prices on to their customers, yeah. meaning the companies that manufacture now, uh, goods. Michael, Michael there, we um, got we to gotta leave it there, Michael, yeah. just because of the Monday schedule. But thank you for your optimism. You saved the show. Michael Purvis uh, with Tallback and Capital. Uh, and that means we've got to get uh, John Farrell to Damian Sassauer, who joins us this morning, riding up a storm uh, this week. And I know John's all fired up about China. I want to go adjacent, Damian Sassauer, to Indonesia. The COVID impact in Indonesia is tangible. And yet their 10-year U.S. dollar piece has gone from a yield of 6 percent, price up, yield down down to a yield of 2%. That's pretty good, isn't it? Well, I, be, I believe that has something to do with the Bank of Indonesia suppressing yields artificially by being active in the secondary bond market. But look, you know, Joko Widodo aside, and what's going on with the Delta variant spread in Indonesia is one thing. Let me pivot to the Philippines, where we have a central bank meeting uh, this week. And yeah. chances are they might actually hike rates there. So, you know, that would be interesting for me. I mean, we have Peru, we have the Philippines. But if you want to talk inflation here, if you want to talk yields, you got to look to China. I mean, I have a gift you for Lisa Abramowitz. You, darn it, you're agreeing with I have Farrell. a gift this for Lisa Abramowitz. Come on. Hey, it's it. Monday morning. It's the 9th of August. And let's talk about factory gate inflation in China. 9% testing the May high. And, you know, the China 10-year okay. yield gonna, this is, too is much. following suit. John, I'm going to have my Tang take over. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about those growth forecasts that are coming out of Ch- mm. China, Damien. It's not just PPI that's coming hotter. It's cut, cut, cut yeah. from the Mora, from Goldman, from JP as well. Can you run me through from the credit perspective? This is your world. Where credit is right now in China, what it's doing to EM, and the prospect, the potential that this could bleed. Absolutely. Well, look, we might have a technical default by China Evergrande, the most indebted property manager in the world, Chinese issuer, big dollar issue, big issuer of Kung Fu dollar debt. Uh, we might have, uh, by the end of this month, uh, China Huarong, some issues there, obviously. People are looking for color there. I expect another rating downgrade there as well. If you look at local AA rated China government, uh, China credit yields versus, uh, AAA versus AA, which is 
high yield versus investment grade, it's actually compressed to its tightest, I mean, in, in recent memory, Jonathan. That's not what should be happening if you have this default risk underlying the surface in China. And with the spread of the variant, you're absolutely right. Everyone's downgrading their GDP forecasts. You know what that means, Jonathan? That's good for China government bonds. Bond yields should go lower. Today, they rose on the back of that inflation data. Interesting. Get your head around that, honestly. Damien, thank you. Let's continue the update through the week. I'd love to do that. Damien Sasa of Bloomberg Intelligence. That, that is good. one story we've got to stay on top of. Here's another. Some revisions over at JP Morgan to their Treasury forecast, 10s and 30s. They cut yields forecasts on by 20 basis points to 175 on 10s to 240 on 30s. Right now, 10s 128, 30s about 194. So they're predicting a lower yield. They're predicting a high yield but lower than they were, Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it makes sense given Thank the research sense. flow I saw this weekend. Coming up, 8.30 Eastern, sense. Claudia Sam, the Jane Family Institute, a conversation you do not want to miss. From New York City this morning, good morning. Tom Keen, Lisa Abramovich, Jonathan Farrow, this is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Rishka Gupta. The U.S. Senate could pass that $550 billion infrastructure package as soon as today. Lawmakers moved a step closer to a final vote by agreeing to limit debate on the measure. 18 Republicans joined with all 50 senators who caucus with the Democrats. It's an indication of bipartisan support for the bill. The Biden administration faces the reality that returning to the Iran nuclear deal may no longer be feasible. U.S. officials are reviewing their options after months of talks on re-entry into the accord failed to produce an agreement. Iran's found ways to cope with U.S. sanctions and it's racing towards the capacity to build a nuclear bomb. Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway is reaping the benefits of the U.S. recovery. The conglomerate's collection of manufacturers and retailers bounced back in the second quarter. That group of businesses posted its second highest quarterly profit in data going back to the middle of 20 2009. Overall, Berkshire's profit rose 21%. In South Korea, Samsung's billionaire vice chairman Jay Lee will be released from prison Friday. A justice ministry committee recommended that Lee receive parole. The de facto leader of Samsung was sent back to jail for a second time in January. Lee was convicted of using bribery to win support for his formal secession at Samsung. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. They're thinking of hiking rates in early 2023. So beyond that, the balance sheet is going to remain strong, which means that the, the Fed is going to continue to purchase assets uh, on an ongoing basis as add-ons at the auction. So they're going to have their tentacles in the bond market for a very, very long time. So I don't really see them, um, you know, paring back their balance sheet anytime soon. One of the sharpest bond market strategists on the street, Sabadra Rajapa there of SOCGEN, the U.S. rate strategy head from New York City this morning. Good morning. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brabitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Mm -hmm. We start this Monday morning asking the question, to what degree have we made progress towards the substantial progress the Fed would like to see before they start tapering that question after a blowout jobs report last Friday in America. Your bond market 128.17 yields are in by a basis point on 10s. Your equity market negative six points and down 0.14 percent. JP Morgan revising their forecasts lower. Still looking for yeah, high but... yields but cutting those forecasts on 10s and 30s by 20 basis points Tom to 175 and 240 respectively. I was going to say Mr. Barry and the crew over at JP Morgan they must have listened to Sobrato job. It's the same argument Argument, isn't it? Incrementally, we have learned that the FOMC's tolerance yeah. for an inflation overshoot is not as large or as durable as we had previously understood. That's what Jay Barry and the team wrote going into the weekend, Tom. That's JP Morgan on 10 year yields. Tom, you mentioned Indonesia a little bit earlier. Yeah. And Tom Orlick and the team at Bloomberg Economics have put together the PMIs. Just look at who's south of 50 right now. 
Thailand, Vietnam, yeah. Indonesia, Malaysia, sub 50 PMIs, Tom, that's contraction. Yeah. China just on the line, the dividing line between expansion and contraction. Yeah. Asia's starting to go the wrong way. It's a bit softer, in fact, much, much softer than the numbers yes. we're seeing in America. Well, I agree with that, except Damien Sassar put me in the timeout chair saying all that matters is China. So we'll see where that unfolds into August and September. Right now, never in the timeout chair. David Wilson with us. On the records, I say record highs that we're seeing at a record level of the record S&P. What do you have? Yeah, lots of records, no question. You know, Friday was the 150th trading day of 2021. We have 100 more to go. 44 records for the S&P 500 through Friday. Of course, the most recent one was on Friday. So if you look at the current pace and sort of extrapolate out to the end of the year, you're talking about 74 record highs for the index. And that's about the most you've seen in any year since the S&P 500 was first calculated. You know, drawdown's a fancy word right now, but are we, are, are we like numbed, benumbed almost by 10% corrections never happening? Do you, do you see that the street's like lost its bearings? 10%? There hasn't been a 5% drop in the S&P 500 from a high since November. That certainly plays November into... November of last year. Absolutely. I did not know that. Right. 90 days. Yeah, and so that's why we're seeing, you know, the, the succession of records as much as anything is that stocks just aren't going down all that much when they fall. So when they bounce sure. back, it doesn't take a whole lot to get them to well, records again. So I'll put that into perspective. That is true. The S&P 500 has not had a 5% drawdown uh, over the past 190 days. But that's not the most notable thing. In that period of time, the S&P 500 has risen at an annualized pace, an annualized gain of 46%. And that is, you've got it, a record in terms of the pace of gains. Is this bullish because it is momentum or is it bearish in that this cannot continue and has to reverse in some way that is meaningful, Dave? Well, that's sort of the fundamental question at this point. And I suppose the answer really lies with earnings as much as anything. I mean, we know the second quarter numbers are off the charts because last year, you know, so many companies were hit by the pandemic. So you're talking something like 94 percent profit growth for the s and P500 based on our latest calculations. So, you know, the question becomes what happens with the third quarter and the fourth quarter? Do companies deliver more growth or, you know, have they essentially kind of, you know, peaked already? I mean, that's the sort of thing that may well dictate whether, you know, we see a continuation of momentum or any kind of a reversal here. So I don't want to shock Tom too much, but this might be a little bit bullish. And I was reading the statistic, the S&P earnings are projected to have grown 90% in the second quarter. Uh, that's from a year earlier, and that's versus an estimate of a 53% growth. Are we underestimating how much dynamism there is here, there or go. is this all baked in, and how do we even determine that? Well, you can argue that analysts have been underestimating for really the last five quarters. I mean, given the extent of the recovery we've seen in companies and given the extent to which S&P 500 earnings have outpaced estimates, that's been a trend. So, like I say, does that keep going? Mm -hmm. Does that kind of feed into what we're seeing in stocks? Is there an assumption that we're going to get more of the same here? These are all the kinds of questions that kind of hover yeah. over the market as we see record after record for the S&P 500. David. Wilson, thank you so much. Uh, one thing we know for certain, uh, Ira Jersey in the bond market, a really sophisticated morning Monday note, and he's channeling John Farrell. John, I Ira goes right after the German yield conundrum, what the Bundesbank is doing, what you and I are observing of that interest rate differential, the relative differential across the Atlantic it can't sustain. Tom, 10-year yields in Germany right now, negative 47 basis points. The whole curve is negative. Two's out to 30. <clears throat> your 30-year yield, negative 0.02%. Can you take an economic signal, or do you just look at the ECB as a massive monster price-insensitive buyer? How much do you think the lemonade would cost at the lemonade stand that Jeff Bezos lives on that road, Tom, if he had an well, obsession that's with point. lemonade? No, but that's Isn't that the, the point. Problem? Jeff Bezos doesn't live there. And, you know, the allusion to all of technology, and the, as, as Lisa mentions, the dynamism of the United States. It's just it's not there, and that's the disparity right now. And we now. can't look at the U.S. in isolation. Lisa, it's a global bond market. That's the issue at play here. With yields down here in Germany, 
How far can Treasury yields go here from 128? I mentioned JP Morgan looking for 175 on tens. Where's Europe in the mix? What's your call on Europe to make that happen? Or are you just looking for a much wider spread between the two? It's a global market and it's also a changed central banking philosophy where basically printing money and expanding the balance sheet has not led to runaway debt. And so people are saying, well, are these central banks ever going to shrink their balance sheets? Probably not. They're only going to go bigger. And what does that mean long term in terms of real yields? Probably they're going to stay negative. And that's what a lot of people, John, have been coming out with, whether it's in the United States or in Europe, where frankly, I don't see the political will right now to start shrinking the balance sheet. We touched on this last week. This is about stock versus flow. Yeah. Even when the additional bond purchases are finished at these central banks, they will have massive balance sheets that they will continue, Lisa, to reinvest, to continue to reinvest. And that will only stop once they start to raise interest rates. Can you give me a guess right now, can anyone, when you think the ECB will actually raise interest rates and that process of unwinding will begin? When will that begin? Perhaps the better question is, will they ever raise interest rates? And this is becoming increasingly the question also in the United States because people do think, yes, they will hike rates, but only marginally. And then what ammunition do they have left to fight the next downturn? And this is a serious issue that they have to be grappling with right now. Tom, John. it's been 10 years since the ECB hiked interest rates, and that was Jean-Claude Trichet. It's been a decade. It's been a decade, and this is an ECB I, with supposedly a different reaction function now. I had a quiet moment with Timothy Geithner in the beginning of the crisis, John, and we both agreed it will take forever. I think forever is a lot longer than our focus on 2022. Without a doubt. Tom Keane, Lisa Bramvitz, Jonathan Farrow, for our audience worldwide, heard on radio, seen on TV. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with equity John, futures down so six. Good in a base suit. We're negative zero <laughs> point yes, one four percent on the S and P. If you crowdfund Tom and come up with something <laughs> like yeah, I don't know, crowdfund I, I think hundred K would get it done. <laughs> From New York, this is Bloomberg. <laughs> Fed is really concerned with not maximum employment, but the maximum extent of employment. Now it's time to sort of pull back both the fiscal as well as the monetary stimulus. We're ultimately going to stabilize to a more modest growth rate. We are expecting that the market will end the year lower rather than higher. The earnings backdrop will still be quite good over the next year. That is, we'll still grow earnings comfortably. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen. A simulcast on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television. A simulcast after 832,000 jobs created over the last three months in America. John, we reconsider things after that bang-up jobs report. Yeah, we do. It unlocks some higher Treasury yields, Tom, on Friday. And for a yeah, brief a moment bit. this morning, it did the same. We're back to 128 on tens. But there's some tension between your view, constructive on America, and your view of China right now. And, Tom, I keep going back to this because I think it's so important. The number one issue this year has not been demand. Demand's been rock solid. It's been supply and our ability to get that supply to meet that demand. And if things start to be a little bit more restricted in China in the coming months, Tom, do you have to delay? Do you have to delay your call of that full service sector recovery, that full supply side recovery that you were looking for signs of as the year grows older? Weaker yuan, 6.48 now, fractionally weaker over the last number of days. John, I look at this battle, if you will, between the optimism of America and other fully vaccinated areas, or relatively vaccinated, I should say, and versus China. And what I see are houses reacting. We saw Citigroup last week go up to a 2% yield. And now this morning, John, J.P. Morgan goes the other way. Still looking for 175, Tom, but they're cuts. They're 20 <laughs> basis points cuts to their forecast on 10s and on 30s too. But we've also seen some upgrades to the equity market. Tom, I think we saw 4,700 at Oppenheimer with John Stolfus. I think we saw 4,700 from Goldman Purvis. with Mr. Costin. Mr. Purvis, Michael Purvis, out to 4,800 on the S&P 500. And Tom, they believe rates can remain stable. Right. Right. low and earnings can remain tremendous through the year ahead. Lisa, we see the combined study that we do on Wall Street, maybe some of the optimism out there, but the partition over the weekend on this pandemic is absolutely extraordinary. The, the difference here between selected southern states and selected northern states is just jaw-dropping. And what it highlights really is the divide in the areas that have emphasized the vaccine and those that still are skeptical of its efficacy and its safety. Uh, look, you know, I want to just highlight, though, that some of the, uh, the way that growth has been hampered has actually 
actually helped the long calls in stocks because people say it will keep rates where they are for yeah. longer. Meanwhile, you have a Fed that's being pressured to respond, which will cap how high yields and inflation can potentially go. This is increasingly the consensus, which is a great Goldilocks scenario. The question that I have, just right. to be in character, is how long can it last? John, very quickly here, I heard a blurb over the weekend on follow the UK and Israel. What's the pandemic doing in the United Kingdom? I've what we learned track. in the UK, Tom, is that the peak in cases took about two, three, four weeks and then things started to fade. The caseload in the UK is still quite elevated, but Tom, the good news has been the relationship between cases yeah. and deaths is nowhere near as tight as it was. That correlation is no, nowhere near what it was oh. a year ago. And Tom, if you want some constructive news on the pandemic, I think the UK example is still a decent case to look it, at. It is. So let's get a constructive data check in here. We start with the Dow futures. We do that for John Farrow. Dow do futures we? negative 106, yes, just actually. under 30, 35,000. <laughs> the VIX out of stick, 17.22. Standard & Poor's negative 8. NASDAQ giving me a little green on the screen. What interests you, Mr. Farrow? Well, you mentioned Dow futures just for our audience. I am leaving, but I was planning to leave anyway. If you think <laughs> I'm about to walk out based on that. Got to be somewhere. Lisa's going to take care of the 9 o'clock for you. Yields, Tom, back to 127. 112.58 last week. This market is still really, really you, whipping wait, are you going in the on, Treasury market. Are you going out for a fitting on a base suit? I'm going to go and get a base suit. Okay. The, crowd, the crowd fund was very profitable. Yeah, yeah, $100,000. Came in at about 100 k <laughs> which is what it would take for me to, to wear that suit on this yeah. network. Um, so, yeah, I'm feeling good, Tom. Okay, that's good. I'll be well, back shortly. Oxford is over. I think it's next to Armani on 54th Street. And I Just can, looking for a good tailor. You know, How do you get that bulky fit? I'll find out. Bulky. I'll have a chat about it. Oh, you get man. bulky, I get the John, bulky one. To get the bulky one. <laughs> can I get Dr. the fit with the suit jacket? Oh, on radio. Five size is too big. <laughs> to help you out on radio fit. here, you know, I'm channeling <laughs> the present. Look at those, I mean, Marcus. Don't taper the pants. <laughs> I, I want to look. That, this is the fit I want, and then I'm going to take a photo of this. I'm going to be late, Tom. I've got to go. Goodbye. Thank John you. Farrell uh, starting us on Monday <laughs> here, and rumor Cheers. has it he'll return for tomorrow. He may go away, you know, maybe Capri's in order for Tuesday. Right now, <laughs> saving us David Riley, Blue Bay Asset Management, and seriously, an important discussion here on the new dynamics off the American Jobs Report. David Riley, is, is John and Lisa mentioned earlier, from where you are after that jobs report, are you walking in the office glass half full, or do you walk in glass half empty? I walk in glass half full. I, I, I think that jobs report, which was strong across the uh, board, does really signify just the extent to which there is positive growth momentum in, in the US. And I think it does actually mark uh, an, an inflection point in terms of the rally that we've seen in, in, in rates. I do think rates are going to move um, higher from, from here. I, to be fair, I thought that earlier as well, and they didn't. But I, I do think there is an inflection point because I think we're going to be getting, you know, close to a million jobs uh, being created. Right. And, and that basically means that we're in a countdown to, to taper. The inflection point buttresses up against a wall of money that is looking for bills, notes and bonds. How do we get an inflection point with the trillions that are floating around? Well, I, I think it's absolutely true that there is this still sort of huge um, sort of excess savings and uh, liquidity, and there's still a sort of bias towards um, safety, which means that, you know, government bonds are going to continue to be, um, you know, very, uh, very well bid, but they still respond to, I think, underlying um, uh, fundamentals. And what we can see is that the US economy has uh, strong momentum. It's creating the jobs. Uh, the Fed is going to respond to that. I do think that inflation is going to say somewhat uh, more elevated and stickier than uh, many anticipate. And in response to that, the Fed will start to uh, taper. So it's going to be buying fewer bonds. The private sector is going to have to absorb more. And I think the market will then start to reprice the path of uh, Fed funds rates as well. And I think that means that we will uh, end up with higher long-end yields and, and higher uh, real yields as well. Perhaps higher than where we are now, but as J.P. Morgan and others have done, they've been lowering their long-term expectations for how high Treasury yields can go, in part because if the Fed does react the way that you're talking about and the way that the market uh, expects, that will actually dampen growth, dampen inflation, and lower the potential for long-term yields. Have you also been lowering your expectations for how high they can go? Uh 
Well, actually, not very much. I mean, what we have been doing is, and what we've been sort of thinking about is, you know, where do we think is going to be the end point in terms of uh, rate hikes? What's going to be the, uh, the 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 terminal rate? And I still think that's going to be through this cycle. Um, you know, somewhere around about sort of two percent or or, or, or t two and a quarter percent, which means you've still got another sort of 50, 75 basis points really of repricing um, to to go. So you know, came into this year thinking the 10-year yield would, would end the year around 2%. That is looking quite a long way um, off at the moment. And obviously, we're going to need to see the data to sort of validate that um, forecast. But I still think that's ultimately where we get to for, for, for the 10-year in this cycle. What's the equ equity reaction if that were to happen? Uh, I, I think it largely depends on the pace at which you see that adjustment to um, higher rates. If, if those rates are, uh, are moving higher because actually you know the global economy, the U.S. economy is doing uh, very well, and actually that we're, we're we're going into a world where um, in 2022 we're also running significantly um, above trend, uh, then I think the equity market can 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 absorb that. I mean, I think you will see some. Um, volatility, and I think we're going to see some volatility around any sort of taper announcement mm -hmm. as, as well. But over the medium term, I think you know risk assets, riskier assets can 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 absorb higher rates. David Riley, thank you so much with Blue Bay Asset Management. It seems to be a Monday to regroup. Chris Verone out with a really good note where he reemphasizes sort of value cyclical, and that Lisa Bramutz, and he has an observation of the underperformance of Bezos Land. Amazon is 852nd out of the Russell. 1,000. Lisa, I didn't know that. That's really extraordinary. Wait, say that again. A Amazon in the last 12 months is the 852nd worst stock of 1,000 in the <laughs> Russell 1,000. That's underperformance. And 52nd worst stock. Yeah, there's 851 stocks that have done better than Amazon in the Russell That's 1,000 kind of in the last shocking, year. actually. Yeah. I just thought that that was a, a, a very good point. And, you know, we're, we're seeing this in the – there's just a research churn over the weekend. Now, Lisa, what research did you see that caught your eye? Well, I was looking at China, actually, over the weekend, and I thought that it was really interesting how people are reassessing the policy risk of the authorities taking a harder stance on some of these social issues and who is going to be next. And you're seeing some of the chip makers selling off today as a result of their being concerned about manipulating prices yeah. too high in semiconductors over in China. But on a broader sense – I think that this is the question, and frankly, uh, we were just talking about it, this idea of have we hit an inflection point with yields? And a lot of people are saying no, and right now the market action is no. Yes, it takes it a little bit higher, but the Fed cannot alter the well, long-term trend, which is still slow growth. I just look at the wall of money out there. Chris touches on that over at Strategus as well, talking about uh, the popularity of uh, buying price up and yield down as well. On that, we've got a 10-year yield, 1.28%, 30-year bond. I'm watching out to two percent we are not there 1.93 uh, percent in the 30-year uh, bond this is a treat this is like we, what we want to do with surveillance always on oil on the not collapse but simply the bid falling away on oil edward morse will join us he is with citigroup they're head of all of commodities our research for global wall street must watch must listen please stay with us this is bloomberg good morning With the first one news, I'm Ritika Gupta. A new report from the world's top climate scientists sees no end to rising temperatures before 2050. The assessment comes from the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It says the planet will keep warming unless there are drastic moves to eliminate greenhouse gas pollution. The UN Secretary General calls the report a code red for humanity. A wildfire in Northern California is now the second largest in the state's history. The Dixie Fire is black and nearly a half million acres. It's prompted mass evacuations and is just 21% contained. The fire started July 13th and is one of more than a dozen major fires in California. The infrastructure bill has now cleared its last procedural hurdle in the U.S. Senate. A vote on final passage could take place as soon as today. The $550 billion bill is the cornerstone of President Biden's economic agenda. If the Senate approves it, the measure then goes to the House. U.S. Infectious Diseases Chief Anthony Fauci says booster shots should go soon to people with weakened immune systems. That's a further sign of how the Delta variant keeps shifting the strategy for fighting the pandemic. On NBC, Fauci said he supports vaccine mandates at local levels, such as schools and businesses. 
Germany's BioNTech has raised its forecast for this year's coronavirus vaccine to $18.7 billion. BioNTech and its partner Pfizer have signed contracts to deliver some 2.2 billion doses of the two-shot vaccine this year and more than a billion doses next year and afterwards. The COVID vaccine is on track to be one of the best-selling drugs of all time. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. This nation was founded 245 years ago. We had no national debt. Three years ago, it was about 20 trillion. I think now it's knocking the door 28 trillion. And it's growing at a rate far in excess of the growth rate of the economy. And when this party ends, basically, it's not going to end well. Leon Cooperman with One View there with Omega Advisors, Chairman and CEO. Lisa Brownson, and Tom Keene. Uh, John Farrell on assignment right now, believing to buy a beige suit. We welcome all of you on radio and TV. And this is a joy, particularly for September. Edward Morris is at Citigroup working with a team of very smart people, and they're working on the definitive deck for petroleum that will become widely tweaked and available into September. Ed Morse, your deck, which we've taken a glance at, is a bombshell document. You say there's going to be oversupply, that there will be many regime changes. What's the regime change in oil I need to focus on? Well, I think there are three bits of a, of a, of a fundamental change. Uh, the first one is to just look at home, at the U.S., where uh, for the last decade, uh, the U.S. production was growing at a remarkable rate. In fact, the U.S. in that 10-year period supplied 73 percent of the total world energy incremental supply. And that's just not going to happen again. I'm tempted to say ever again, but really not again. Uh, and uh, that's going to change things a bit. The U.S. has had a really significant impact on the world. Uh, it put OPEC plus into a defensive mode. Uh, they are still in a defensive mode. And I think they'll remain in a defensive mode. And there's a, a second issue that I think is a bit of a regime change, namely that OPEC was really flourishing because of the ability of the OPEC producers to say, we don't have to worry about today so much. It's tomorrow that we will have our day because demand is going to be rising forever. Right. And, uh, and the supply will be ours. So now, both on the supply side and on the demand side, right. that's being challenged. And on this day of UN action on climate, 3,000 plus pledges as well. We've observed that China has coal. That's got to get fixed. But also the U.S. needs to step up some form of cogent policy. What is the more efficacious policy for the United States on climate change and linking it into your world? Well, I think we're getting a head start on it. I think we need the government there to create a framework. Governments didn't have any framework before the Paris Agreement, uh, and they, they got a framework, and the bond market simply skyrocketed for sustainability. Right after that, the Paris Agreement said, hey, we need three to uh, $5 trillion of investment. Uh, in 2019, the bond market only gave $250 billion worth of issuance of sustainability bonds. 2020 was a half a trillion, and this year we're on our way to a trillion. So uh, we need more government framework to get the infrastructure bill that we need. We need infrastructure build to sequester carbon dioxide. We need the infrastructure build to get hydrogen from where it's produced to where it's needed. And I think that's the challenge to decarbonize in the country. To dovetail this out into your call on oil, have we seen peak oil demand already, or do you foresee that upcoming in the next few years? We don't think that there's uh, peak oil demand yet, but we think it's coming. There's a bit of a debate on it. The question to us is really a question of when. We were on a track to hit 110 million barrels a day of demand, all else equals, by 2030. Um, and because of policies already put in place, not because of the pandemic, but because really of the policies put in place by China, the U.S., and Europe, that will be at, a, at the most probably 107 million a day 
and we think that the policies that are unfolding will get it to 104. So the, the, the pace of growth of oil demand, the elasticity of demand for oil to GDP is really falling much more rapidly than people thought, uh, which puts us really into getting to that peak oil demand period uh, into the early part of the next decade. This is part of the confusing backdrop, the list of unknowns that you lay out as we look at oil prices currently, w WTI, $65.61. Uh, the path of change, people were talking just two months ago of $100 a barrel of oil uh, foreseeable in the next few months. Could we still be there or has the scenario changed? No, I think the scenario has not changed. What we're seeing is a lumpy reaction to, uh, to things that might happen. Uh, we just look at the supply and demand balances. Inventories are drawing at a record rate. Uh, and, that, and, and they're drawing at a higher rate this month than they were last month. Uh, and we think that next month it'll still be at a higher rate. So inventories are really tight. They're tighter than where the price of oil is today. And that's because financial flows uh, have gotten a little bit short, a little bit prematurely, partly because of the discussion you were having a little earlier, partly on the basis of an assumption that rates are gonna go up and growth is gonna go down. Uh, but really the market, if you look at a snapshot of the here and now, is a very tight market. So uh, <clears throat> we think prices are gonna go up uh, again to the, to the mid to high 70s before, uh, before we have yeah. that regime change that I was talking about coming in. Ed, eight years ago, you and Anthony Yuan wrote a really important, widely acclaimed document on China and coal. And you said, look, at some point this ends. Give us an update right now on what to me seems to be the global elephant in the room in commodities, China and coal. What's 2025 look like? Well, we still think that it's going to look better. I mean, the, the, the China issue has never been one of climate change. It's been one of pollution. And uh, under social policies, the government has to deliver clean air and clean water. Um, and they're going about as fast as you can go to use every means possible to uh, electrify the country, uh, to move off of fossil fuels. Uh, but they, they just can't do it fast enough, and that's given rise to, uh, to more coal demand. That coal demand vote recognizes higher BTU content, lower sulfur emission content uh, coal. So it's not, not all that bad. But uh, yes, the China push in the post-pandemic revival uh, has put a great stress on the growth of power generation. And you can see it not only in coal, but in, uh, but in mm -hmm. other fossil fuels and natural gas in particular. Uh, but that will slow down as the economy changes. Ed Morris, change thank you so path. much. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. Really look forward to that important definitive deck from Citigroup on commodities uh, and oil here uh, in September as well. Lisa, I remember when Ed did the thing on coal here a good seven, eight years ago, and it just received truly worldwide acclaim. And, you know, he said got the optimism there, but I just don't see it in the present statistics. Yeah, right now they are sobering, and that report was sobering. Um, another thing that's kind of sobering, I have a surveillance confession to make. When you were talking about how Amazon is one of the worst performing stocks in the Russell 1000, I didn't believe it. You know, I personally have seen them doing pretty well year to date and yeah. fang names are doing pretty well and i took a look and sure enough they're up about two percent year to date and this comes on the heels of that earnings report just to put it into perspective they were up more than 11 percent through the end of july just to show you just sort of exemplifying how that projected forward earnings yeah. it matters and they were saying it can't continue with the pace Huge mystery, Lisa, out here for the back half of the year, what the fangs do, and each exactly. of them with their own original story. Certainly Amazon with massive, massive capex to build out the next 100,000 uh, employees. Coming up, Claudia Sam with the Jane Family Institute. Claudia Sam on a fully employed America. Red and green on the screen, futures at negative eight, down futures negative 115. Stay with us, this is Bloomberg.
Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance, Lisa Bramowitz and Tom King. John Farrell off on assignment looking for a beige suit. We welcome all of you on radio and television. And uh, it's an interesting day. Lisa, what's your observation on the data that we see? I see yields, frankly, not moving as much as I thought they'd move off jobs. Which is interesting considering the fact that a lot of people thought inflection point uh, could be in the offing. It's down with 1.27% Treasury yields after really surging on Friday on the heels of that jobs report. Maybe it's not an inflection point. We will have to see. This is a joy, and it's not a joy because of her important tweet stream on Puffy the Cat. Claudia Sam joins us now with the Jane Family Institute with exceptionally important Twitter flow. You can really learn a lot, a lot particularly on the microeconomic foundations of all this blather we talk about each and every day. Claudia, I want to go to the heart of the matter right now. Shock and awe, if you raise wages, good things happen, like consumption sustains. Tell us where we are now in the oomph to raise wages. Yeah, so I think we've seen a lot of encouraging progress, frankly, surprising. I mean, after years and years of low wage yeah. growth and really tough conditions, like we're seeing it. So we know it is possible. What I want to underscore is we do not have the headwinds to keep this going, right? We've had reopening, the vaccination starting. We had people wanting to get back outside and see family. Government put money in people's pockets. Like that relief is running out. That low hanging fruit of opening up is running out. So, or it will at least soften, right? Well, so then it's a big question do we keep these wage gains? How do we do it from a policy basis? I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're mourning the death of Richard Trumka, E.J. Dion, with that wonderful essay today in the Washington Post. And there's talk about labor share finally regrabbing something from the era from Ronald Reagan forward. Do you buy a policy shift or not? So I've argued that we are seeing a sea change in monetary and fiscal policy. I really do feel the Fed is well on its way to its new framework, thinking harder about its dual mandate, jobs too. I am more concerned about what's happening on the Hill. Right, We're seeing an infrastructure package, which is amazing. We've had years of waiting for infrastructure week. It's really happening. And yet, that's not, we have an over $20 trillion economy, $1 trillion over 10 years in our like productive capacity. That's not much. And what I really want to see and what we learn from putting money in people's pockets is if we extend the child allowance, if we invest in our next generation, that's where the payoffs will come. And it's really not guaranteed that we're going to see that. Well, that's what we need for long-term growth and long-term support of workers. Claudia, in the meantime, it is countdown to Wednesday where we get the latest consumer price index, the read on how much prices for the average consumer are going up, and they are going up in staples and aspects and things that people buy every day. Can you give us a sense of what you think the Fed's response should be of this? Because, frankly, it is the most onerous for the lowest income Americans. Right. So I think the Fed has been right about this from the start. I think the data is coming in in terms of team transitory is winning here. We know that the factors, if you look under the hood, the factors of this extraordinary jump in prices, like I don't want to underscore the pain that this caused, but these are not things that are staying with us. I mean, just the used motor vehicles, like those prices are coming back down. Right? We should not change course and abandon the millions of workers who are not back to work just because we're going to have six months of prices that moved up faster than we expected. Well, so I think it's just, it would be so wrong to change course on some CPI numbers. And, and a lot of people would agree with you, Claudia, but then they pair that with this increase, this divergence between uh, the wealthiest individuals and the lowest income individuals, especially because asset prices have been one of the most inflated areas of the economy. And so, frankly, a lot of people say the Fed's policies have only widened this divide. How can you say, OK, well, maybe so, but it's worth it? Yeah, I am extremely frustrated with how much focus the Fed is getting right now. We need Congress to act. There are ways to address wealth inequality, and the Fed does not have them, right? And there, there's taxes, there are transfers. The Fed cannot go this alone. And the idea that raising interest rates a couple, you know, basis points, quarter basis points, is going to fix a longstanding problem in the U.S. economy, it's ludicrous, right? Like, we're 
just to think that yeah. could really move the ball, it, it's frightening to me that we've put that much power in the Fed. Claudia, you've always been equal opportunity. You go after conservatives, and frankly, folks, <laughs> Claudia Sam is fearless about going after liberals as well. Claudia Sam, there's a conservative angst out there. They're worried about the debt. They're worried about the deficit. You know, there's an institutional conservative thrust that says, wait a minute. How do you respond to an inbred American conservative ethos? They're really worried about the size of government. I mean, we saw really massive tax cuts under Trump that had incredible increases in the deficit. And now to be saying we can't we can't raise taxes, it, this is not about the deficit, which I mean, we should be concerned about, right? Like you should watch these numbers. The debate right now is do we want to set up social programs that are going to be wildly popular, like the child benefit when it gets working, that's putting government more in a role, whereas conservatives have really looked to the private sector, well, looked to individuals, and it's just not enough. Lisa, I, I, this is just incredibly important to me. If we have a natural disaster like a pandemic, we can't get any kind of shift in our child care policy relative to other equivalent nations? I think a lot of people are questioning this, which goes to the fierce debate that's happening in Washington. And the reason why, frankly, there's this agreement even among the Democrats about how big that uh, that infrastructure plan, the human infrastructure plan should be. Uh, and then the pushback that you were talking about from the conservative stance. Claudia, you did raise a really important point that you are frustrated with how much power people have seemed to have given the Fed. The question is going forward, do they take that power or do they actively fight against it? Because right now, especially with a balance sheet that's $8 trillion and poised to expand further, a lot of people say, well, look, you might say you don't hold a lot of power, but for all intents and purposes, you're subsidizing the U.S. debt load. That is a political act. Right. It is. They are taking a risk, right? But the, what they are trying to do is stay out of the way of Congress. Right. We know after the Great Recession, too much weight was, I mean, really responsibility was put on the Fed to do it alone and get us back to full employment. And the Fed doesn't have the tools to do it alone. It knows that it can play a supporting role. It can play an important one. And it has during the pandemic. Jay Powell said over and over again, Congress do more. And they have not backed off on that narrative. Yeah. So I think that's what the Fed understands. And as long as we get both pieces, that's good. But without Congress and long-term investments, we're not going to see this sustained in a way that we so could. Right. We're in this moment. We could do this. Let's broaden out. Uh, one thing that we talk about every week as, the, as we get the initial jobless claims is this worker mismatch. And at about 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern mm -hmm. time, we're going to be getting the job openings, the jolts data for the month of June. And there is this question of why there are so many people who are out of work. And then you have all of these employers saying we can't find any workers. What is the why behind this? What are we missing? Right. I think we really have to keep our eye on who is in the labor force, who is coming back. What was really unprecedented in this labor market was the fact that we had millions of workers just leave jobs, right, in what was a very severe recession. So a lot of this are parents who needed to help stay home with their kids for homeschooling. A lot of it was older workers who were afraid of dying, right? So we need to bring them back. And on Friday, there was a lot of good news in a million jobs, like that is great news. A lot of that were people being recalled from temporary layoff. We didn't see the needle move enough on the out of the labor force and the long term unemployed. And we know historically long term unemployed are tough to get back because that it's, yeah. the longer you're out, the harder it is to match you back up. So I think that's what we're seeing. And the last mile is going to be the hardest here. Claudia, we got to leave it there. Claudia Sam, thank you okay. so much. Jane Family Institute, Great. and just always interesting, uh, linking in our actual market economics into academics and the policy um, as well. Lisa, I'm not really sure where this goes. What I do know is the markets will battle it out almost separate from policy, but I'm not sure they're immune from policy.
Well, some people would argue that the reason why Treasury yields went so much lower than they were earlier this year is because of policy, because we originally were talking about a multi-trillion dollar infrastructure plan, and that got whittled lower and lower, and now the chances of this bipartisan uh, bill, a $550 billion bill, uh, is likely to pass, yet the Reconciliation Act is basically a 50-50, according to a lot of analysts. So you start talking about, well, what's the fiscal impulse? It's a lot smaller than we thought earlier, and frankly, it's it's going to fade, and I think a lot of people are pointing yeah. to that for the underperformance well, of certain cyclical areas. That's the gloom part here is the fade, and of course the parlor games through July and August has been to recalibrate and remeasure that fade. The J.P. Morgan announcement today, I think that many, many more to come, Lisa, as people tweak not only full faith and credit, but what other bonds are going to do as well. There's a question, someone said last week, I'm forgetting the guest who said this, that treasuries have become a policy tool. I love that because that is the truth. When you have a central bank that's buying a significant proportion of the uh, issued debt, then all of a sudden it is what they do that determines yeah. very much of the level. So the question is going forward, what's their reaction function and have they migrated into turning certain corporate debt also into policy tools based on what they have done yeah. in the recent past. And I think what the market is saying is, yeah, you're going to squelch the credit cycle, you're yeah. going to keep volatility low, and we will act in accordance to well, that. The solution is for the Fed to act like the Swiss National Bank and buy a gazillion shares of Apple. That would is solve that your recommendation? It. That would solve it all, absolutely. Here's your entry point. Two-year yield, 0.20%. Ten-year yield, 1.27%. I can't get out to 2% in the 30-year bond, but... You know, there's a little bit of a migration yeah. there. We should note oil yeah. challenge. American well, oil well under $70. And we've been talking about the dollar and dollar stability. We're going to continue that yeah. on the open. Uh, Stephen Englander, Standard Chartered North American Macro Strategy Head. The reaction function you there. You have Steve Englander? Yeah, we have Steve Englander. Yeah, well, you know, maybe you can come over. The man from Del Monte visits. This is Bloomberg. Stay with us. With the first word news, I'm Rishka Gupta. The U.S. Senate could pass that $550 billion infrastructure package as soon as today. Lawmakers moved a step closer to a final vote by agreeing to limit debate on the measure. 18 Republicans joined with all 50 senators who caucus with the Democrats. It's an indication of bipartisan support for the bill. And the Biden administration faces the reality that returning to the Iran nuclear deal may no longer be feasible. U.S. officials are reviewing their options after months of talks on re-entry into the accord failed to produce an agreement. Iran has found ways to cope with U.S. sanctions and it's racing towards the capacity to build a nuclear bomb. And it's a victory for Norwegian Cruise Line and its vaccine requirement. A preliminary court injunction will allow Norwegian to require proof of coronavirus vaccination as a condition of boarding its ships in Florida. A recent state law in Florida bans vaccine requirements. That law has put on, put on hold for now. And in South Korea, Samsung's billionaire vice chairman Jay Lee will be released from prison Friday. A Justice Ministry committee recommended that Lee receive parole. The de facto leader of Samsung was sent back to jail for a second time. In January, Lee was convicted of using bribery to win support for his formal secession at Samsung. And the price of coffee, well, it just keeps rising, but consumers don't seem to care. Prices for Arabica beans are up 50% in the last year, hitting seven-year highs last month. The drought and frost damage crops in Brazil, the world's top producer. If prices at the retail level go up, analysts say consumption is unlikely to be hurt much because coffee drinkers are so addicted. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg. Quick take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. to look at them in a different light than the durability for a normal person, which means that we will almost certainly be boosting those people before we boost the general population that's been vaccinated. And we should be doing that reasonably soon. In the trenches, Dr. Fauci with Fareed Zakari over at CNN over the weekend. Always an interesting conversation and this heated debate in this nation on this pandemic. Right now, not only our interview of the day, 
on this great debate, but frankly, the interview of the year. Lawrence Gostin owns a high ground at Georgetown, yes, as a professor of medicine, but definitive on law. His work at Johns Hopkins, his work at Georgetown and Harvard has been noted for decades with, with uh, important books written as well. I want to talk, Dr. Gostin, about the thing that comes up in every conversation, which is the privilege versus the right on whether it's drunk driving or having a beer, or in this case, on vaccination. Are unvaccinated people of a right or a privilege? Which is it? Oh, well, it's, a, it's, it's certainly not a right. Um, and thanks for asking that. You know, that's a, you know, it's a really important question. I want to say first, you know, nobody should be kind of shaming or blaming people who are unvaccinated. That's entirely unproductive. It's not going to change hearts and minds. But, you know, you can do anything that you want to do for your own health and safety, but you don't have the right to put someone else at risk. So you don't have the right to go unvaccinated and unmasked in a crowded workspace or in a crowded classroom. It's very clear to me um, that no one has the right not to get a vaccine unless they're going to yeah. be hiding themselves away and not exposing others to infection. The courts seem to be siding, a la cruise ships or Indiana University, with the institutions. Does that surprise you? It doesn't. You know, I mean, we do have a very conservative court, uh, uh, judiciary, you know, Supreme Court and all right down. Um, so you can never sh be sure um, but the law seems to me to be, you know, uh, so, rock, rock solid, um, basically saying that, you know, businesses, um, mm -hmm. colleges, universities, um, cruise ships and others um, absolutely can right. require vaccinations as a condition of going to work. What do you presume we will see? And I'll pick on Florida with the really grim hospitalization statistics there. But there is a mantra of Jacksonian states' rights. How will that state deal with the battle between Jacksonian states' rights and courts saying, no, you got to go the other way? You know, it's going to be really rough. Um, you know, Florida is actually one of about 12 states that have actually passed a law banning proof of vaccination systems and banning local mask mandates. You know, one of the things that I reflect on is, is that, you know, in in the conservative tradition in the United States, normally we give a lot of autonomy to businesses and to local governments and to local health officials. And so states are really, you know, abridging the rights of the private sector, uh, universities and others to actually ensure that their mm. workplaces are safe and secure. You know, and there's a wider freedom here, and, and that wider freedom is, you know, the freedom of all of us to get yeah. back to all of the things we love, and that'll only happen if most people are vaccinated. Professor Gostin, thank you so much for joining us today with Georgetown University and just absolutely definitive on this raging right and privilege debate over the pandemic. It is also a right and privilege to know that Michael McKee in September will be asking questions at the Fed meeting, and he'll do it off of the next jobs report, which follows on a three-month moving average of 832,000. Reset us, get us out to early September in the August labor report. Is there any... Can you, can you extrapolate forward from the great news of 90 days? Well, we'd like to, but the problem is this is such a unique situation. And now we have the Delta variant, as you were just talking about, that raises questions about whether or not people are going to be willing to go back to work, those who have not already gone back to work. We also have the question of child care. Now, some schools around the country are starting up, so we may see a positive impact from that. But if they go to virtual school again because of Delta, yeah. then again, you got a problem. And, and every history here is that means it's a Fed and there's a single prescription. We need to wait for more data. I'm not in any—I mean, the speeches today or next week, do they really matter 
if, if we're just going to wait for more data. No, I don't think anything really matters to Wall Street except for Jackson Hole. You really uh, think you're Chairman selling Powell. this trip? No, well, I'm selling the trip. Yeah, are you absolutely. Gonna, are you wear I need a beige to go. Suit? <laughs> I have to decide. I like yours today. Mm, I will. Silent. I will wear a cowboy hat. Um, but <laughs> but I, what I got to tell you is that. Um, we don't know if Jay Powell's going to say something important or not, but Wall Street thinks he might. And so that's where the focus is going to be. And then we'll come back a week later and get the August jobs report and see where we are. I mean, we come back and, you know, the, the data's there. How critical is CPI this week? To me, everything is transitory just to get out step by step by step to more data. Am I right? Well, uh, you look at what has gone up in price, and there were something like 10 items that accounted for 55 percent of the rise in CPI. So if those items like used cars or car rentals start to go down in are price, they doing, well, that somebody could said take this some earlier, pressure Are we off. seeing other lumbers which have come back? Well, we have seen used car prices at the wholesale level fall, and so maybe that translates into CPI. We have to wait and see. But we'll be looking mm -hmm. to see if other areas go up. While the uh, right. w while the others come down, and the CPI is only supposed to go up half a percent, right. which is quite a big rise. But that's about half of what it went up in June. The acclaimed McKee conviction meter uh, is really pretty grim on the Boston Red Sox right now, to yeah. say, say the least. But the McKee conviction reader, when you read the research over the weekend after the jobs report, do people have a lot of conviction, or do you look for a lot of tweaking and adjusting, like we saw from J.P. Morgan on bonds today? I think people are pretty happy with the way the labor market is developing, because even if it slows down mm -hmm. a little bit, as you mentioned, the three-month average has been strong, and we still see people going back to work, and there are a lot of possibilities for September with schools opening and the end of the unemployment benefits, uh, the extended unemployment benefits. It's uh, inflation that has people concerned. Right. Uh, and the fact that people are going back to work and making more money to do so adds to that inflation question. Mm -hmm. So we'll watch mm -hmm. this week's Ugh. inflation data. I'm out of time. I can always go longer with Michael McKee. I wanted to talk to him about potential GDP, which comes off the research of a lot of really bright people. One of those is Michael Faroli with J.P. Morgan, their chief U.S. economist. Their research note off jobs report I thought was really illuminating. And, of course, their bond team comes in with an adjustment of lower yields today from 2 percent down to 1.75 uh, percent. But really looking forward to Michael Faroli on radio and television, 12 noon uh, today. Let's do the data to save the hour right now. Uh, real simple, Dow negative 100 is now negative 74, SPX negative 5, and the VIX was out of stick. Comes in a little bit. I'm sorry, 17.11 on the VIX to start the week is a pretty constructive uh, number. I do have green on the screen for the NASDAQ as well. We're watching oil. Thank you, Ed Morse, for coming on with Citigroup. This is Bloomberg. Stay with us on radio, on television.